Does this sound okay? The the taping? Okay. Well, well again, we want to welcome everybody. We we've got a lot of technology working here. As I mentioned, we're streaming the the conference live as well as we've got an off-site location up at Redwood Falls with uh, growers there with one of our consultants, David Whitman. And we welcome them also to our winter conference. We're here to talk about crop and market alternatives for future profitability. And I think the real key thing we're going to emphasize is that we're all challenged right now with commodity prices and agriculture. Uh, it seems like when commodity prices are down, livestock prices are up. And that's kind of the scenario we're working with right now. But really what we want to focus on is market alternatives to get you thinking outside the box as well as profitability. Often in agriculture, if we're involved in crop production, we tend to focus on yield per acre and not profit per acre. So we want to talk about that as we go along today. That's the real key point of, of what we want to get at as we're going through the next two days. We hope what we can do is provide you knowledge, understanding, strategy, and processes to achieve ongoing profitability. That's really what we'd like to have you walk away with, is how can I be more profitable? How can I think a little bit outside the box? And we know in production agriculture, there's a lot of things we deal with. Change is very difficult for many people. We have peer pressure in our local communities. When we do something different, often I hear growers say, well, you know, everybody's watching me and what I'm doing because I'm doing things differently. And Ellen and I had a little conversation about that already today. This is just my opinions. I believe the present conventional agricultural food system is very inefficient and mismanaged. And things are going to have to change. And we're going to see a lot of pressure from people that are living in the cities, like Des Moines right now. The water works in Des Moines is suing three counties upstream because they're dumping, on average, 50 pounds of nitrogen annually down the tile line into the Des Moines River that they drink out of. Out of the six watersheds in Iowa, the data shows they're dumping between April 1 and the end of July $157 million worth of nitrogen down the tile lines. This is going to have to come to an end. And the reason is, is because we're mismanaging our soils and our crop production systems. All life, number two, is based on soil. Soil health determines crop and animal profitability. The Creator gave us a wonderful system to work with. The trouble is, and this isn't true of everybody, because there are farmers out there today that are doing a good job 
of improving or maintaining soil health. But for the most part, our soils are dead. They're not active. And this is what's led to a lot of issues, uh, not only in plant health, but animal health and human health. Usually all diseases are led by the lack of proper nutrition or microbial activity or balance. So microbes, number three, are the balancers of life. They're everywhere in our environment, personally, as well as in the soil and on the crop and with the animal. And you, this is one thing that we need to learn to study more. And there's an article in your handout today talking about microbes in the human body. Do you know that there's 10 microbes for every cell in your body, and you have trillions of cells in your body. And there's hundreds and thousands of species that w live and work within us. Our digestive tract has three to five pounds of microbes. And this is your immune system right here. And if you don't have the right microbes in this system right here, you cannot be healthy. We're here to talk about profitability. I got this from working with several people, and this is the projected cash flow right now in the Midwest for corn and soybeans next year. And I'm sure there's all kinds of scenarios that will go with this as far as cost, the land rents, et cetera. But we're pretty well locked in at the way it looks right now with low commodity prices versus what we've had the last three to four years. Right now, they're projecting on average about $81 an acre um, loss on corn, and if you're farming 500 acres, that's over $40,000. On soybeans, they're projecting about $33 an acre loss, and that'd be about $1,600 on a 500 acre operation. So what are we going to do to change that? And that's the real question as we move forward, and that's what we want to talk about, is how do we bring more profitability to an operation? So when you look at profit, what goes into determining profit? Well, it's pretty simple. It's input cost, output, price, that determines profit. So can we manage and do a better job with input cost? Absolutely. And when we balance the system and we improve soil health, we dramatically can drop input cost. We know that biologically active soils that are properly balanced will have less pest pressure. We know that there's 39,000 tons of nitrogen above every acre that we can harvest if our soils are healthy and breathing. And we're going to talk a lot about the third crop in our rotation and cover crops. And the reason we're talking about that is because we want to improve our cost production and we want to improve the quality of what we're producing so we can get more value from it. So when we look at it, output cost, it's all about quantity and quality and value. Are you just a producer of number two yellow corn or is there opportunities with other valued markets? Same thing in soybeans. When it comes to price, we can sell commodities or we can sell value added. Now we got grain millers with us today and Bruce is going to talk here in a minute. And they are crying for quality crop output that they can use to improve their milling processes and improve what goes into, into their human uh, grain products. And so by understanding what they want in their quality assurance program, can we be a quality producer for them and get a premium? And then if we're for example, producing oats, can we learn how to pre-digest pre and ferment the oat straw to increase its value as for animal feed? Absolutely, and we have the technology and know-how to do that. So it's about profitability. We talk about the Profit Master Full Circle System and, and how we can glean more from every acre and more from every animal, but it's all about balance. And, and balance is about biodiversity. It's about mineral balance, availability. It's about carbon. And we talk about bioactive carbon, not just carbon, because most of the carbon we got left in our soils today is dead carbon. Why 
aren't we holding nitrogen in Iowa because our soils are dead? There's nothing to hold it. We don't have the biology there. We don't have the ability to hold. And if nitrogen is going down the, the, the tile line, so is many other nutrients. And, and so as we look at this, we have to look at it holistically. And this has kind of evolved. You know, I started independently in this in 1979 with the idea of getting to where we are today. One of the things that we've done as we've progressed is we've learned how to fit rotational and cover crops into the okay, okay, uh, system so that we can improve soil quality and plant health and animal health and provide nutrient-rich manure going back out into the system. If you don't have livestock, maybe you could marry up with a livestock producer and because they, they have a lot of need in two areas. One, usually, is they need high-quality forage, and, and two, they need a place to put the manure that they're producing. So there's partnerships that we think can be achieved here with a little bit of understanding and a, a little better knowledge of how to do it. It's all about balance. So it all starts with a frame of mind, and you have to have a mindset. If you want to use cover crops, as the speakers will tell you, it's not a slam dunk situation. You've got to learn how to do it and do it properly. What is your objective? What do you want to accomplish? And then put together a system to do that. But you have to have the frame of mind to do it. And, and many times when you talk about corn and soybean producers here, you know, the excuse is, well, there's not enough time to do it. We don't have a long enough season to do it. You know, us that have been in this, we've heard all the excuses, but yet there are growers that are making it work. And so how can we make it work? If your interest as a producer is to be more profitable, to leave your farm in better condition for the next generation than it is, then what can we do to achieve that? So it's really a mindset. So when we talk about soil health, we talk about it being the cornerstone to the crop, livestock and processor part of our industry. It's very key. And so what determines soil health? We've talked about this already. It's really about biodiversity, biodiversity of the microorganisms in the soil. These microbes are unbelievable balancers, and they produce things that you can't even comprehend. We're going to talk here today about fermenting and pre-digesting forages and tremendously improving the value. These microbes that we put in here produce all kinds of metabolites and things that are good for that animal that aren't originally in the feed itself. And we can dramatically improve milk production and meat production with any animal that eats a pre-digested fermented forage. And so we will talk about that today. But biodiversity brings diversity in the microbes and the mineral balance and availability. And it brings, of course, what we're after is bioactive carbon. So microbes are the driver of, of soil health. So healthy soil is active, it's, it's alive, and it's continuously regenerating and improving itself. You know, as, as growers, if we start when we're 20 years old farming, we've got 35 to 45 years to, to make a difference. And every year that, every time we cycle that year, our soil should be improving in biodiversity and bioactive carbon and nutrient retention. Our costs should be going down, our yields should be improving, and the quality we're producing should be going up, and we should be getting more value for that. I'm a, a beef producer, but I'm a value-added producer. I raise Akaushi cattle. And I was telling Bill that the steaks on this animal are so uh, sought after in, by people because of the quality of the meat. They dress out over 80% prime that they're wholesaling right now for $42 a, a ribeye. And so I'm in a value-added market, and I'm using value-added techniques to improve the quality of the meat that I'm producing. So how do we build it? We've talked about this. How do we build a, a high quality, 
producing yet low cost soil system? And again, the answer is we have to have plant diversity. And that's why we're talking about the third crop in the rotation and we're talking about cover crops. That's the only way you're gonna build diversity. And we need to think about our forefathers that inherited these rich prairies. And Gabe Brown talks about uh, they've gone out up there in Bismarck, North Dakota on these native prairies and count over 100 different species of plants in these prairies. But yet, in our wisdom, we, we farm a monoculture, corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans. Sometimes, you know, growers are doing other things, but we really have come to a monoculture type production system. And that is a dead end road because we're, we're not building the diversity we need in the plant health and our soils continue to degenerate because of it. So what we want to learn today is how can we put in a third crop like oats that the grain millers want to buy from you? but you have to meet their quality assurance program if you want to sell it to them. So we want to, again, learn how to do this with a third crop, cover crops and forages, but we're also going to learn how we can take these forages and ferment them and pre-digest it. I mean, a lot of you, at least I can remember, looking down in the basement in the winter or in the fall with dad making the, the cabbage, putting it in the crock, crock and, and, and then putting a lid on it because it had to be anaerobic and making sauerkraut that we ate that winter. That's the fermentation process. This has been around since the beginning of time. And, and Fran, my wife, ferments a lot of her food because it improves it. It improves the quality of the food. And these microbes, again, produce things that normally aren't in that food, whether for livestock or for humans that really dramatically improve the health of, of the individual or the animal eating that. And so we're going to talk about that. So the benefits of expanding your crop rotation are the things we talked about here again. And we need to learn about these terms, bioactive soil carbon, biodiversity, nutrient retention, availability, and balance. This is how you can, as a producer, improve your soil, reduce your input cost, improve output and quality, build sustainability. And so what I'm gonna show you here is real quick, is just a little video clip. Gabe Brown talked at the Albert Lee Seed House this fall and we videoed all of that. And he's gonna talk about a guy over in Ohio, uh, David Brandt, who's been doing this for a number of years. And we'll just see what he, uh, Gabe says about this individual. the other one. They were farming about three inches apart. We took a step over in the neighbor's field, dug down in just a tight yellow flake, just ugly stuff. We took a step over into David's field, 18 inches, the most beautiful black top soil you've ever seen. It's absolutely amazing. He changed the soil completely. They're actually naming a soil after him now because they've never seen anything like that in Ohio. But, but that's a true story, and if you ever get a chance to go to David Brandt's, do it. We can change Okay, what he was really saying was that David Brandt lives in Ohio and has a very difficult soil to work with. It's got a, a yellow clay underbase. And he's been able to produce 225 bushels of corn with very little input at all. And he's done it because he's used uh, rotations and used cover crops. He's improved the drainage and the aeration of the soil. And Gabe Brown is, lives up north of Bismarck, North Dakota. I don't know if some of you have heard Gabe talk, 
He's going to be at the Midwest Saw Conference uh, coming up next week up in Alexandria. But, you know, up there, for them to get over 100 bushel corn is a stretch. They raised, you know, 75 to 85 day hybrids. Last year, Gabe, with no additional out input, such as commercial fertilizer and pesticide, raised 142 bushel corn per acre at an input cost of $1.45 per bushel. Now, even in this market, he's still profitable. And I think Gabe and many other producers around the country have learned, have learned already how to do this. Now, you can kind of decide if this is something that appeals to you and uh, might be something you want to work into your program. So really the crust of what we're here to talk about the next two days, this is a slide right here, is how if you're a crop producer, if you want to raise a third crop and you have straw or you have forage or you have forage cover crops, you have livestock producers within 100 miles of you that need feed and I think you'll find that most of you do, then could we then marry up to them by going to them and saying, what do you need and what's your quality assurance program? And could you in, introduce them into a, a new concept of pre-digesting the forages? What percent of a forage that's fed to a beef cow or a, a dairy cow ends up being utilized, do you think? Anybody got an idea? Yeah, what is it there? 41%. 41 percent of what goes through that animal from the mouth to the tail end in 30 hours is utilized. What impact would that have to a beef operation or a dairy operation if you can improve that by just 10 percent? Think about that. And remember, I told you when you fermentate this material, you get all kinds of extra goodies in there that you normally don't have in the feed to begin with. If, if Bruce wants to buy your oats, could we find a way to bale those oats and pre-digest them and add more energy to that dairy operation? And the answer to that is yes. And then we have food processes. There are many of them out there today. Grain millers is just one. They have a plant down here in San Angsker. They got a non-GMO plant up here uh, by the Mankato area. And they're, they're crying for relationships with producers. So, uh, this is something that we want to talk about as we go through the program. So we want to learn how to tap into, the, into third crop markets for grain and forage, take weather out of the equation when harvesting moisture for, uh, high moisture forage. In other words, would you like to be able to bail at any time the forages that you put down from, from you know, anywhere from your normal 10 to 12 percent up to 70 percent, preserve it in the bail and, and eliminate all aphitoxins and mycotoxins? Would that help? You can absolutely do that. So we can even do it with straw, and we'll talk about that. And how about would you like to produce more high test weight grain? And it's all about mineral. It's all about mineral to do that. And so today, Bruce is going to share with us alternative cash crops and market opportunities, and Andrew's going to come on and talk about building biodiversity with cover crops. And then TJ is going to come and, and talk about establish a crop and livestock partnership. And then Ken Hamilton, who will be off-site, that we're going to stream live. Uh, he's in Arizona. He's normally from Logan, Utah, but he'll be making a presentation. His daughter just had a baby down in Arizona, and so he's going to be live from Arizona. And then Larry Acker will come back, and we'll talk about weather and market trends uh, this afternoon. And Larry is just a really a great guy. And he has a lot of knowledge in both weather and markets, and he kind of hooks them together. Tomorrow morning, we're going to have Matt Earhart from the Alberti Seed House come and share with us his uh, view on conventional versus traded seed, and he'll talk some about what they've done, got done in the old production area. Dennis is going to come up and talk about big yields, start with healthy seedlings. And then Ken Hamilton will come back on and kind of tell us how we can improve the the quality of our crops and our forages and getting better test weight and brick levels in those. And then David Whitman will talk about manure management and enhancing its value. And then TJ will talk about choose the right cover crop mix for your operation. And then David will talk about our financial program. There's a lot of growers uh, now that 
are looking for financing and we have a complete financial program in the company that we can offer growers for input or operational financing. And, uh, and then we'll kind of talk about cash flow projections and moving into alternative crops and forages with David Whitman and, and TJ again. And then Dennis will come back at the end tomorrow and kind of wrap it all together and talk about a strategy for 2015 uh, of what we can do. And we have some very unique technologies and, and products in the company. A lot of the information is in your folder, um, but we also have demonstrations around the room that you're going to want to visit, some additional things that you can pick up. This is an opportunity for all of us to get to know each other, share, and learn from each other as we go through the, through the uh, next two days. Um, restrooms are, are down where you came in. There's another men's restaurant upstairs if you want to go up there. If it gets crowded, we'll have a break. Um, questions? Please ask questions as we're going through the program. We would ask the speakers to repeat the question, please. And um, again, just uh, let's just create the environment here that we can all have a good learning experience with each other. So with that, uh, I want to bring Bruce up. And uh, Bruce is going to share with us what Brain Millers is looking for from, from you as growers. And, and so I, I look forward to that too. So Bruce, when well, you want to come up? Um, I'll give a little bit of a, a more formal introduction here when you get that ready there, Bruce. Uh, Bruce is Director of Crop Science for Grain Millers, and after more than 36 years with Quaker Oats Company in Pepsi-Cola, he joined Grain Millers in June of 2012. He's a native of Northwestern Iowa. He grew up on a family farm and graduated from South Dakota State University where he majored in agronomy and ag education. During his career, he's been based in Minneapolis, Cedar Falls, and Chicago. He uh, has brought Based business experience includes commodities and ingredients purchasing, crop research and development, uh, mill feed sales, hybrid and varietal breeding program administration, grain milling and grain quality education and development programs. He travels extensively throughout the U.S., Canada, and many other countries in the world representing grain millers. And so grain, he comes to us with a lot of uh, a good pedigree and a lot of experience, so we look forward to spending time with you, Bruce, and sharing with us, you know, how we as growers can partnership with grain millers and what you're looking for from us. Very good. Is this on? Can you hear me in the back? Can you understand me? Do you even care? <laughs> you came for the coffee, right? Okay. We're on the right target then. Um, thank you for the intro. Uh, one of the problems of getting older is your bio starts sounding like your eulogy a little bit, you know, and it gets lengthier and lengthier. And as Jim was going on, I wanted to find a chair and sit down and stuff, you know. But uh, I have had the benefit of working uh, in the grain milling industry my entire career. Uh, started out after college and some grad school with. Uh, uh, the Quaker Oats Company, where I had worked as a summer intern, and we had some high school yield contests called the Oats Improvement Program, which were very popular in this region, if you remember back in the 70s and 80s. Um, then in 2001, Pepsi bought Quaker, and we became part of the Frito-Lay Quaker family. And in 2012, I left <coughs> that organization and came to Grain Millers, primarily because I wanted to get back to work directly with ag research. Uh, I wanted to be able to uh, fund some public oat research. And I wanted to be able to buy grain directly from producers. And a lot of the grain companies, because of all of the legislation that's gone on with food safety and bioterrorism acts and all of the other regulations that are being imposed upon us by the food manufacturers, it becomes more and more difficult to try to look at traceability, look at food safety standards here in North America. 
And I got to tell you, during my career, I've had a lot of opportunity to travel globally, uh, China, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, uh, Europe a lot. And if you think we have regulation problems, my God, go to Europe sometime. If you as a farmer wanted to sell a load of corn out of France today into a food manufacturer, corn miller there, you would have to have a certificate of analysis that's done every six months on every bin with 17 different criteria on that. Not physical grain criteria per se, like test weight and moisture, those are included, but every mycotoxin you can possibly imagine, and has it been certified, and have you had an agent out there to certify that lot going forward, just for the opportunity to sell the grain to a food, to a food manufacturer. So uh, we don't have it too bad, and God help us, I hope we never get that far down the pike, uh, but we've got a lot of legislators in both the US and uh, Canada today that are looking at those food safety standards. They call them codex, you know, the, the uh, US, or excuse me, the world standards. And most of those people know as much about raising food as, or grains as I know about flying an airplane, you know. I'm not saying that they're dumb by any means. Well, let me put it this way. If dumb were dirt, they'd cover about two acres, you know. So, um, first of all, is there any media in the room? I need to censor it if there is. Any lawyers in the room? No lawyers? You know how many lawyers it takes to grease a combine? Two if you run them through slow enough, you know, so. <laughs> I'm not here to sell you anything today. I'm here to talk to you about something I believe in, and that's diversity back in the farm. We've gotten too far down the pike on corn, soy, corn, soy, because it's been, <laughs> forced upon us to make it sound like it's easy. You know, the chemical companies, the seed companies, yields have been increasing. Good for them. To do that, we've been pouring on more and more chemicals to do it. I grew up on a farm in Northwest Iowa. And about 10 years ago, my brother and I said, you know, we wanted to put in some new waterways through the main part of the farm. And to do that, I said, okay, you know, we're going to hire a guy with a cat and a dozer, and he's going to come in and, you know, take out part of the old pasture ground and things like that. And we're going to put in some oats with a legume underseeding. And he said, yeah, I figured you'd say oats since you work for a Quaker Oats company and stuff. And I said, yeah. So I got certified seed. We put it in, and the oats got about four inches tall and keeled over dead or in a doornail. We had so much, and you could tell right where that pasture line had ended. The oats in the pasture line went on and did an outstanding job, you know, went to seed even. The, the ground that had been corn and soy routinely, the oats got about four inches tall and keeled over dead. We had such a buildup of triazines and trifluralin compounds in that soil type that as soon as the oats got down to about the three, three inch, four inch level, it hit that zone and died. Now, that's 10 years ago. The chemistries have changed to a degree, okay? We've found out that, you know, the old treflans and the old atrazines and stuff like that that we were using did have a longer half-life than we were led to believe by sales forces and ag chem companies. But what they also didn't tell us was the synergistic effects, one plus one equals three. So not only did you have a little bit of carryover from the previous year, but they, if you had a carryover from a couple of years before, it was even worse. So today, with Liberty, uh, Roundup, those technologies, shorter half-lifes, we don't have the soil carryovers and stuff that, that we had before, but we have mined those soils so deeply and so completely and changed the structure so much that we need to look at introducing, in my opinion, some of the small grains and some of the legumes back into that rotation to make for a healthier crop. Let's see if I can get this to work properly. Okay, I start these off with, these are not your father's oats. You know, remember how dad and grandpa were able to, you know, raise, geez, 70, 80 bushel oats routinely, and they went out there with a swather and they cut them down and, 
And they went in with a combine four or five days later and picked them up. And gee, they always had good test weight. And they didn't have a lot of problems with it. And, you know, they sold it to the elevator in town or they fed it and stuff. Well, obviously the times have changed. If you go around to about six out of 10 elevators in the area here today, they won't even buy an oat. They don't even know who to call to sell the oats to. I don't have the bin space. I don't even know how to measure that today. They're out of practice in doing that. So what message does that send to you? Eh, corn and beans, you know, they'll always take those. The genetics have changed. Your soil structures have changed. Your chemical programs have changed. Your equipment has changed. We're using a lot larger, heavier equipment today than we ever did before. The planting equipment, um, we did a webinar for Practical Farmers of Iowa two nights ago, and I was talking about this, and I had a farmer text in and say, I'm real interested in going to 11-inch drill spacings. Will that work for oats? And yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on in Canada doing that. And the reason they want to do it is so that they can pull a wider toolbar, you know, and cover more ground faster. And you know what, I can still put down 23 plants per square foot. However, you're packing it all into one row. You need to understand the morphology and the physiology of the plant. How does it absorb the nutrients? What's going on underground, which is just as important as what's going on above ground, particularly with the small grain? How is the sun being absorbed? New varieties target a usage. There are varieties out there, and we'll get into some of the varieties that we're recommending that are early and short and work very well. And if you're interested in a horse feed market like there was in St. Ansgar 20 years ago, they want a white oat. They want a very super heavy oat over 40 pounds. You know what, the hull doesn't really matter and the color of the oats is all the same after you take the hull off. We're more interested in what the nutrition composition and the uniformity of that oat is. There's oats that are higher in beta-glucan and I'm not gonna get into a nutrition study you know, with you, but beta-glucan is that portion of soluble fiber that is on the heart health claim. We have to have a minimum of 4% beta-glucan in any of the varieties that we buy in order to make that heart health claim, the one that's on Cheerios and the one that's on Quaker Oatmeal and Country Choice, our brand, and some of those. Whether it's organic or conventional, it's got to have that heart health claim. Uh, new cropping patterns. There are some issues with following, uh, with oats following a few of the crops, particularly the ones that are taking a lot of sulfur out of the ground like uh, you know there's a big drive further north here in Minnesota and uh, over in North Dakota with canola. You know you need to understand what those crops in the rotation are taking out of the soil and what they're using. The plant disease pressures have changed. Uh, you know the public plant breeding programs and I'll tell you that there are less than four so figure out there's about three private companies in North America that are doing any oat breeding. Otherwise, it's University of Illinois, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, and Wisconsin. And Wisconsin just putting an oat breeder back in after an absence of about five years. That's where all of the oat varieties are coming from in the Midwest here. That's why we're seeing more farmers looking at Canadian varieties. Can I do that? Well, yeah, you can, but you need to understand maturity and you need to understand different disease pressures and that sort of thing. We had a bad crown rust problem last year. Anybody here last year raise oats? Was your, did you see crown rust or leaf rust? You were one of the fortunate few that did not. Um, it, it was a problem in Iowa particularly. Uh, southern Minnesota was hit and miss. South Dakota seemed to miss. North Dakota got plastered with crown rust. That's the fungal growth that attacks the, the plant and we'll talk about how some of the nutrition that affects some of the disease susceptibility a little bit later. New harvesting and storage capabilities and I use the word capabilities loosely. 
you know, because we as farmers, as agronomists, focus the 90% of our attention on genetics and on production. You know, how much fertilizer? What sort of an ag chem program should I use? And oh, by the way, I got it to the bin, it must be safe. You know, no, there is more da damage done to a crop from the time that you enter the field with a combine and get it to the elevator than all of the other preceding management decisions you made. Did you swath? Did you not? Did you use glyphosate to desiccate the crop? Did you not? How did you set the combine? Have you ever looked at the combine manual and looked for the oat setting? <laughs> it ain't there. You know, a few of the machines will have a setting for malt barley. You know, look at those and look at how you set that cylinder clearance, the fan speeds and stuff for qu milling quality grain. The quality specs have changed a little bit. Um, when I started my career down in, in uh, well, on the trading floor in Minneapolis, uh, buying grain for Quaker on the floor and then went to Cedar Rapids, Iowa to the mill there, and then to St. Joe, Missouri, we would take oats down to 32 pounds. But we were buying oats directly from the farm, okay? And you can mill a 32 pound oat. You can take the hull off of it, providing it's dry. But the key to a miller, now grain millers mills oats at three locations, St. Ansgar, Iowa, Yorkton, Saskatchewan, and Eugene, Oregon. We mill corn at Marion, Indiana, about 7 million bushel a year of food grade corn that goes into grits, meal, flour, the cereals. Um, the thing that's common between those two is they're called a dry milling operation. We're not an ethanol plant. We're not a corn sweetener plant. We don't take whatever quality the grain is, throw it into a slurry, heat it up, extract the starch, extract the sugars, you know, that sort of thing. I tell farmers, if you're going to sell grain to grain millers, if it's good enough to put in your mouth, or more importantly, the mouths of your children, it's good enough to sell to us. Because we take the whole grain, we either dehull it, de-germ it, in the case of corn, we fractionate it, we size it, we make sure it's pure, and we do conventional, we do non-GMO, and in the case of the, the corn and oats, we do organic as well. That's going to go, that's intended to go into somebody's mouth. So those are the quality specs that you need to understand as a producer and we need as an industry to do a better job of communicating to you. And then the whole thing about climate change. Now, wherever you're at on the spectrum about weather cycles and climate change and whatever, I mean, well, there's entire series of lectures that can go on about that. The important thing to remember is how does that fit into your crop rotation? Because the weather has been more unpredictable and more variable in the last 10 years than it was previously. You know, little warmer winters or a colder spell in the winter and stuff. That affects not only your planting decisions and your hybrid decisions or variety decisions, it affects how you're storing that grain. I bet if I surveyed the producers in here today, 90% or more of you would say I'm storing more grain on farm today than dad did or percentage wise, or than I did 10 years ago. I'm all for that. You should be marketing grain every month of the year. I firmly believe that. Unfortunately, with a lot of the small grains like oats and wheat and barley, they tend to get marketed, and, and these are studies that have been done by the Wheat Growers Association, North American Millers, particularly in the case of oats, farmers tend to own to sell oats twice a year, right off the combine and right after planting. Those are the two lowest basis points in the season, and yet we wonder about profitability of some of these grains. We do it to ourselves. The climate with these large steel bins, and we'll talk about that a little bit more down the line here, changes and can affect the quality of that grain. I point out this map, which is very, very busy, but I want to show you that um, 
This is where oats are grown in North America today, primarily. Uh, there's still a strong dairy region up here in Quebec, over into New Brunswick. They're raising oats, uh, and very profitably. One thing for sure, to get crop insurance in Quebec or New Brunswick today, a farmer has to buy certified seed to get crop insurance. They cannot understand the crazy Americans that don't buy certified seed every year. They just, I don't understand that concept. You know, we know it's better. We know it's better, not only germination, but better viability. It's cleaner, yada, yada, all this, the stories with that. There's a pocket up here that used to be a big beef country in a lumber company, a country up in Northern Ontario. The problem is there's no railroads up there. <laughs> so those oats are being raised nice 40 some pound test weight oats. They wind up being trucked all the way down here and then by ship into the Ohio region for racehorse. The best oats for the last 50 years has been what they refer to as the Wisconsin Valley, which includes eastern Iowa, southeast Minnesota, and central Wisconsin. Those have always traditionally been some of the best oats anywhere in the world. We had a strong dairy industry. We had a strong hog industry. Um, today, it's just easier to do corn and beans, apparently. The only company that's buying oats directly from the farm, and there's Quaker in Cedar Rapids, there's uh, grain millers in St. Ansgar, and lacrosse milling in Cochrane. There's only one of us that's buying oats directly from the producer, and that's grain millers, okay? Quaker gets 100% of their oats, and I can tell you that with authority because I worked there for 37 years. 100% of their oats are coming out of Canada today by rail. They don't even have a, a bid in Cedar Rapids. There used to be a big pocket where the circle is of oats in northwest Iowa and uh, southeast uh, South Dakota, but they've gotten on the corn soy bandwagon as well and you can drive all day and not see an oat field up there anymore. The Dakotas, well, besides mining oil up there now, uh, they really like to try to raise barley. And the problem is the last four or five years, the fusarium fungus has been so bad that the malsters, raw malting up here in the cities, Anheuser-Busch and Fargo, they're going way out west and up into Canada to get barley that does not have Don, deoxynovalenol, or vomitoxin, as it's commonly referred to, uh, in it. And one of the fallacies in this whole thing is they're saying, oh, gee, the, you know, the fungal organisms are changing. Yeah, to a degree they are, because we are setting up an environment for those fungi to overwinter. You know, what's the crop in North America that has the most fungal growth in it? Corn. So as we push the corn belt further north, we've just made this natural greenhouse, if you will, for a lot of the fungal growth. Uh, and there's a lot of corn. When I started my career, and even up to about 15 years ago, I could drive from Fargo out here to Minot to look at some of the university plots. And I'd see maybe a dozen cornfields that would be used for uh, silage mostly for livestock producers. Today, those grain elevators are all buying corn, and it's going north up into those big feedlots into Manitoba, the hog lots and stuff up there. So the, most of the oats that are consumed in North America today are coming out of two provinces, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And by the way, right above the L in Parkland there, is where Grain Millers has our second plant, second largest plant, and that's in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. And we buy all oats directly from the farm up there in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And we're doing the same farmer seminars there uh, that we do down here to try to talk to you about quality. Okay, a profitable oats production strategy requires a crop rotation strategy, know how oats fits in, a field selection. And you know, for years, we've called oats the Rodney Dangerfield of the crops. It gets no respect. You know, 
uh, I got this little piece of ground over there, 10 acres. It's a little too wet for corn. I can never get over 120 bushel of corn. I'll throw some oats on there. You know, I need a little grass or I need a little forage. Well, if you're going to treat it that way, you know, as dad used to tell me, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. You know, if you're not going to try to raise that crop as a profitable crop, you're going to get a mediocre one. Field selection, you want a well-drained, healthy soil. Oats are deep rooted of all of the small grains, wheat, barley, rye, oats goes deeper. It's got a much more fibrous root system. It loves the soil, providing it can get down in there and mine those nutrients. Oats germinates at about 47 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit in a cooler and wetter soil than wheat or barley. If you can provide a little bit of stimulus to that through an inoculant or whatever, those oats will pop out of the ground very quickly and they'll do a very good job for you. You need to have a well-drained soil, you know. A variety selection, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Weed control strategy, there's good news and bad news here. The good news is oats are extremely tolerant to most of the older herbicides, 2,4-D, the dicambas like Banville, MCPA, but make sure you use an amine formulation, not an ester. Remember, oats has a wider leaf than wheat or barley, okay? It's got a lot of chlorophyll there. It also, remember that the oats, up until they're about the fourth leaf stage, you know, 10 inches tall or so, that growing point is below ground or at the ground level. So you can drive it off, you know, feed it off, frost it off, herbicide it off or whatever, and generally speaking, it will tiller and come right back and be okay. Uh, but if you hit it with an ester formulation, it will stunt that plant back uh, quite a bit. Um, it's quite tolerant to um, most of the current herbicides that are used in other rotations, you know, on, on corn and soy. Harvesting and storage, I'll cover that in a little bit. And then I've already mentioned you should be marketing oats a lot more times during the year um, than we traditionally do. Field selection, I've been through some of this already. Uh, they can tolerate a cooler, wetter soil, rotate it with corn and, and uh, beans, canola, hay fields. A lot of farmers are still primary use uh, for establishing a good oat stand is they want to be able to put down. I, I know, John, I keep moving back and forth. I don't stand still very well. I think he's sitting there probably getting dizzy with the camera. Um, they, they use oats to establish a good stand of legume, and that's fine. But there's different varieties you should use for that. You know, I would encourage one of the earlier varieties to get a good legume stance going. You know, maybe cutting back that plant population a little bit uh, to, get, to get it going. But those are all strategies. You need to know how it fits into your rotation. Clean seed. Um, I want to do more studies, and Mac is here from Albert Lee Seed House. We want to do some studies to try to verify that certified seed more than pays for itself. I firmly believe that it does. There's so many anecdotal studies, but the university's just, uh, you know, small grains, we're not going to do that. You know, we're, gee, BASF is going to give us a million dollars to do some herbicide studies this year. You know, that's a lot better than worrying about a little bit of certified seed tests. We're going to try to do some to show the yield and the return per acre benefit, perhaps through the quality of the oats as well as yield to certified seed. Um, if you're not growing organic, yeah, fungicides work. You can use Tilt, um, Stratego, which is a combination of the, uh, the uh, propiconazoles along with the uh, having a memory blank. It's a combo of two different fungicides, though. It's a little last, longer lasting. Headline, if you've had headline on corn, it works, but keep the dosage low on it. The main thing with the fungicide is most of the farmers wait until they're, you can see from the field that the field's turning a little orange, you know, 
it's too late. You're, you're way past the damage. Uh, you need to, to scout the oats when it's at the two to three leaf stage. If you're seeing some of the red pustules there, you need to spray it at that point in time. Mac? Uh, Yeah, it, it can. It, it, it. But it doesn't turn into time. And I, and I, and I, having talked uh, about this with a lot of people, um, they're a little nervous that if, that if oats, that if fast growing oats are just going to spray their own crop two times a year with a fungicide, whether they need it or not, it's going to render those fungicides um, useless. Yeah. Buckthorn. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I agree 100%. We, we can overdo some of this. I call it recreational spraying, you know, because, well, we don't have to go out and cultivate anymore. We might as well go spray something because I got the sprayer anywhere. And the more acres I cover with that sprayer, the better the marginal utility, right? Wrong, you know. Uh, Bruce, can I, can I just make a comment here, too? Sure. And I agree with, with Mac, but, you know, one of the things that we're looking at, and we've talked about this, you know, we look at this disease thing as being really a nutritional problem. And if we can go in with some good biological seed coatings that have trace elements with them, and then come back with a biological spray over the top with the minerals again, really what we want to try to do on this disease thing is we have to create that competitive exclusion and keep them off the root and off the leaf. And so we think that there's an opportunity to, to look at this strategy too. Absolutely, Jim. And we're going to talk later today about putting some plots out to look exactly at that. You know, do some of these biologics actually work? I can tell you in Europe, um, I, I have had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in the UK and Scotland and in uh, Ireland where oats is a very viable crop in their crop rotations, not just because it's a crop that they can sell, but because they understand the benefits of it in their rotation and their environment, they wouldn't think of using save over seed or not using an inoculant to get that crop off to a good start. That's both with winter oats, which is in the southern half of the UK, and spring oats in the northern half of the UK. Again, I encourage you to plant oats early. This is a strategy that sometimes doesn't always fit with the organic producer a little bit because they're saying, eh, you know, I had some uh, ragweed problems in that field last year or I had some Canadian thistle. I'm going to wait until they germinate and then I'm going to go out and harrow and get that out and then put the oats in. Okay, if that's your strategy, I understand it. Just understand that oats is a cool season crop. It likes the spring. It likes early summer. It doesn't like temperatures over about 85, 87 degrees Fahrenheit. It slows it down. Before I forget it, uh, and I'll get to your question, Mac brought up another point with the fungicides. Yes, they're approved. Yes, you can use them. Some of them are cost effective. The other thing to remember though, I don't care which one of those fungicide programs you use, Farmers are telling us they're getting 5 to 10% higher yield with them. What they're doing is delaying the maturity three to seven days. Okay. That's okay if you've got an early season out. If you're planting one of the North Dakota lines, you're going to set back that maturity even further. Okay. So what the fungicide does is slows down the plant's metabolism. And when it does that, you delay the maturity. That can pack in more yield, potentially, if the weather cooperates 
but it can slow it down uh, as well. Question. Why? Yeah, it, it's varieties and the lack of interest. It's an interesting point, and I don't want to take up too much time on winter oats, but I can tell you that it's been a pet project of mine for the last five years. At South Dakota State University this year, they have a full-time oat breeder again. It's the first time in 12 years. And Dr. Melanie Caffey over there uh, has worked on winter wheat as her postdoc. She and I met a year ago, and I said, what about winter oats? Because they're, you know, anything south of about the Missouri-Arkansas border, so Texas, Louisiana, Florida, North Carolina, Arkansas, those are all winter oats. They're planted in September after they take off cotton or whatever, uh, soybeans down there. They put in winter oats. They graze them during the winter. In the spring, they let them green up again and come on. I did one little trial at Iowa State last year, and it didn't work. And Iowa State backed away from the project on me. Said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And I, I, can, I could have kind of told you that it wasn't going to work. They waited until October to plant the oats. They planted it in bare soil. You know, they got no snow until the 23rd of January, and they had the coldest December on record. You know, the oats got about this tall, and I've got pictures of them I could show you if we had the time. They got about this tall and died. Duh. You know, you talk about dumb as dirt, you know. Um, when do you I, put in winter oats then? Well, we did a study, we're, we're doing a study right now at South Dakota State. I've got, I picked 50 varieties, 25 of which I've done the milling evaluations on. I've got them from South Dakota, or excuse me, from Texas A&M, from Louisiana State University, North Carolina, those three locations. I've got 50 varieties. They're in three locations in eastern South Dakota, down by Beersford, by Brookings or Volga, and then up by South Shore, which is by Watertown. Two different planting dates, September 6th, I believe, and September 12th or 13th, a week, 10 days later. We put them into stubble. They all germinated. They all look absolutely great going into winter. I don't know what the, how they're going to overwinter. There's a little bit of study that's been done that said with winter wheat, which is the only real winter crop we can raise this far north, there are three growth zones in the crown of a wheat plant. You can kill two of them as long as the third one is able to regenerate, it'll regenerate growth. We don't think that's there in oats, but we don't know. And because we don't know, nobody's willing to try it. Grain millers kicked $50,000 to South Dakota State University and said, let's try it for two years. If these 50, all die, we'll get another 50. I'm gonna, I want to find winter oats. I really believe we can take care of some of our disease issues. We can take care of some of our weed issues in small grains by getting a good stand of growth in the fall. Leave alone the discussions about cover crops and soil erosion and, and nutrient uptake and this sort of thing. So we're looking at it. We're just not there yet. Okay. Seeding rate, you know, the old rule of thumb, ha, ah, two, two and a half bushel per acre. Well, that's fine if all oat seed was uniform. It's not. You know, there's big seeded ones, there's small seeded ones. Your goal is 18 to 23 plants per square foot. Okay, so in order how to figure that out, if you say you want 25 as a seeding rate, the d number of desired plants, per square foot times a thousand kernel weight. And that's where you have to take a little bit of time at the kitchen table and weigh out a couple of different times what a thousand kernels is. Because some of the North Dakota lines, for instance, Newburgh, Rockford, are a big seeded plant or a big seeded oat. Um, just because it's big doesn't mean that it weighs a lot though, because if you have a variety like Hi-Fi, which is done fairly well in Minnesota, that's got a longer, thinner kernel to it. So a thousand kernels won't weigh as much as a Newberg, which is a little plumper, okay? 
1,000 kernel weight times 10 divided by the expected seed survival. And I don't say germination, I say seed survival. Because as an example, those farmers that are trying to push harvest along, and this happens in the Dakotas, it happens in northern Minnesota, oh gee, I'll just go spray that uneven spot in the field with glyphosate in the fall. Now glyphosate is not registered as a desiccant, it's registered as a late season weed control, but it works. You will kill the plant, it desiccates the plant. Even if it doesn't hurt the germination, it will affect the viability of that seed down the line. I've had certified seed growers in Canada, and it's legal in Canada as well. There's even a high residue tolerance here in the, in the States. You can have 20 parts per million of glyphosate in oats and still make food grade. You can't have 20 parts of a mycotoxin, but you can have 20 parts of glyphosate. Um, I've had seed growers do it. Their germination is still in the 90s, but the oats just aren't viable. You can see right to the line the next year where the glyphosate has been used or a paraquat or any of the other uh, desiccants. So I say that's the expected seed survival on it. Again, certified seed is the way around all of that. I want to talk about the kernel morphology just a little bit to make you understand what we're looking for on it. This is a typical kernel of oats. You know, the groat is in the middle, the germ out of the one end of the plant, and there's two pieces of hull on a typical oat as, as we buy it. It's called the lemma and the palea. And the lemma is this green portion around here. And depending upon the variety, some of them have got a little hook up here. Some of them have no hook at all. Some of them extend this a little bit further. Some of it have a shorter lemma. Obviously, as a miller, we want the varieties that have got a little less thick hull, a little shorter. And then there's the palea, the portion of the hull that lays in there in the canoe, if you will. That palea can also have some hooks on it. So some of the older varieties, you know, Goliath, um, Waldron, some of the old uh, Iowa state lines had a thick hull. And they had the little hooks on there. So it took a sledgehammer to try to get that hull off of there. As a miller, we don't want that, you know. We want to be able to easily dehull it, but not so easily and there are varieties out there that do dehull too easily so that when you go in with the combine and you've got your cylinder speed a little too high or your concave clearance is a little too close, it'll dehull in the, in the harvesting process. That's not good for two reasons. Number one, you will break that groat. It's harder to dry, harder to dry down. And number three, as soon as you take that hull off of oats, you know, why is the hull there? It's a protectant from Mother Nature, okay? As soon as that hull comes off, that little developing germ says, oh, it's time to wake up and germinate. And the way it does that is it changes the enzymatic activity in that growth. The starches start changing to sugars. The carbohydrates change the starch. You start with getting rancidity, what they call peroxidase and tyrosinase starts building. That's why, why do we buy oats in Canada and ship the whole oat down to the United States? You can't ship groats because in two to three weeks, those oats will be sour. Why can't you dehull oats and hold them in the bin for feed for a month? The oats start germinating and go sour, okay? So there's a purpose that Mother Nature's got the hull there. Are there hullless varieties? Yes, they are. They don't yield very well, and there's a lot of breakage in them. They only get used for feed. No one, to my knowledge, in the food industry is using hullless oats today. Variety selection. Here's just a list, and we have that list back at our table as well. Uh, Badger, Colt, Sabre, Spurs, Tack, 
Excel, Shelby 427, Soros, Horsepower, Hi-Fi, Rockford, Newburgh, a brand new one uh, named for my good friend Dion Stuthman, who passed away a couple of years ago. He was the oat breeder at University of Minnesota for 40 years and uh, passed away a couple of years ago. Dion has won the yield trials this last year in Minnesota for two reasons. One, it's, it's well, three reasons, actually. It's a later oat, so it was able to take advantage of a cooler summer this last year. Number two, there seems to be a little more disease resistance present genetically in the plant. And number three, it's a tall oat that did very well this last year and high yield potential. There's a variety out of Wisconsin that was just released. It's been in Wisconsin for two or three years called beta gene. Again, remember that word beta, beta glucan? Yes, it's high in beta glucan, a little higher in protein as well. So if you're feeding the oats, take a look at these because there's a difference in some of the protein levels and stuff as well. Again, you know, it bothers me that farmers don't spend enough time looking at not just yield, but some of these other characteristics, the maturity of the, of the oat, the crown rust susceptibility, stem rust, barley yellow dwarf. Now, barley yellow dwarf is not a fungal disease. It's a virus. It's like atherosclerosis in your body. The way it spreads is by aphids. So if we have a warm spring and we get all these aphids blowing up from the south, on their proboscis or their nose, they're carrying all sorts of nasty viruses and things. And they love going to an oat plant because there's that nice big, nice big uh, green leaf and it's succulent and they bury their nose in, and as they bury their nose in to suck out the juices, they infect it with the virus. That virus spreads and plugs up the phloem tissue. And the way you can see it happening is in those bottom leaves, it's usually in the bottom two to three leaves of the oat plant, you will see it start to turn yellow. And then eventually it'll turn red and the leaf will spiral. And as the head comes out, it's a white head that literally did not uh, pollinate or, or didn't, uh, uh, there's no viable seed there. That's barley yellow dwarf virus. No fungicide is gonna control that. If you are interested in a insecticide like they do with wheat, hit it early, get rid of the aphids. Very sporadic whether we have barley yellow dwarf or whether we don't weather related, amount of aphids related. Um, all of the varieties on our list have been tested. Everything in North America is tested at one site for three years in a row, and that's at University of Wisconsin, or excuse me, University of Illinois, Dr. Fred Kolb, who is a winter wheat breeder, does all of the barley yellow dwarf screening. And the good news is we've got pretty good resistance, natural genetic resistance to barley yellow dwarf. Hull color, again, unless you're gonna go into the horse market, don't worry about it. A white oat is no better than a yellow oat or a tan oat. The groats all look the same, okay? Fertility, yes, TJ. Yes, there is oil content um, from the feeding category. Um, and, and let me back up. That's a very good point, TJ. Thank you for bringing it up. All the varieties that are on our approved list and that I've got listed there have less than 8% oil. There are varieties out there that are higher oil content. So if you're interested in the feed content you know, of it, look for a variety with a higher oil content. If you get over 8%, companies like General Mills and Quaker have a problem with that heart health claim. Oil is fat, and you gotta have a low fat to make that heart health claim, okay? All of these are less than 8%. They've all been screened for that. So thank you for bringing that up, TJ. Okay, moving on to fertility. I'm not gonna sell you fertilizer. I'm just gonna tell you that you better have these elements as a minimum in a good balance. 
Uh, questions always come up about animal manure. Yeah, you can knife in hog manure, chicken litter, whatever. Oats responds very well to it. But remember what each of those compounds do for the oat plant. Nitrogen is directly responsible for several things. Early growth, the greenness of the plant, the height of the plant, and the protein in the plant. Nitrogen directly correlated with that. But you can put on all the nitrogen in the world if you don't have enough phosphorus and potash in balance, all the nitrogen in the world isn't gonna do you any good. Remember, oats is deep rooted. It likes to go down and get nitrogen from down in that corn zone. You know, it loves to grow through that soybean zone and use all that nitrogen as from, from the carryover from the soybean from the year before. But phosphorus is the element that is directly responsible for root depth, root structure, and standability of the stalk. If you rob the plant of phosphorus, and correlated with that to a degree is sulfur, if you rob that plant at all, your oats are gonna lodge. I don't care if it's an early short one or a tall North Dakota full season one. Phosphorus is the one that directly controls it. Now potash, or potassium, you can't take apart the plant cell and find it like you can an amino acid or you know, nitrogen or a phosphorus or something. The element that controls stress reaction in oats is potash. I can take you to two fields side by side, one of them that's shorter in potash, and I can show you the difference because the one with the shortage of the potash available potassium will be weaker, it will show stress faster. Remember, in our environment here in Minnesota and Iowa, the oats mature generally in July, some of the hottest days of the year. The element that controls those st stoma, the guard cells on the bottom of the underside of the leaf, where we get the dew in the morning, that's potassium. If you have a plant that doesn't have an adequate sort of potash, that can absorb the potassium, those cells, guard cells, can't open and close as well. If they can't open and close, guess what happens? More respiration, transpiration through the day, and the plant sucks out more water and doesn't, isn't able to utilize it. If you go into some of the um, alternative crops, like canola is marching further and further south here as alternatives to soybeans. Be aware of the nutrient uptakes of those crops as well. Canola loves sulfur, and you really need to put on as much as 15 pounds of sulfur to get a good small grain crop following canola or some of the other uh, alternative crops. For most of the soils around here, you don't need that. You need you know a couple of pounds available and you may already have that depending upon your crop rotation. Minimum needs, the rule of thumb worldwide, a bushel of oats takes a pound of nitrogen, okay? So a 100 bushel crop of oats, which is the low end of what I expect anybody to get, has to have at least 73 pounds. That's what it'll take up to make 100 pounds. You know, we say a pound of nitrogen available this is the minimum, 27 pounds of P2O5, 18 pounds of K2O, and then some micronutrients as well to balance all of those out. Weed control, we've already touched on some of this. Again, stay with an amine formulation. The second biggest problem with weed control in oats is farmers wait until it's too late. Oh, gee, I got some kosher, or I got some you know, horse weed sticking up through there. I'll go out and spray. And if the oats is after the fourth leaf stage, you're gonna do some mechanical damage. You're gonna do a little bit of setback of, with the herbicides. Spray them early, get them before the fourth leaf stage. Number one, you can get by with less herbicide. Number two, you don't have as much uh, material there to shelter those uh, weeds. And number three, the smaller the weed, the easier it is to kill it and stuff. So um, again, you know, the uh, 
The good news is there's a lot of herbicides you can use to do that. Uh, the bad news is I don't think anybody around here has got wild oat problems, do they? I mean, I haven't heard of it in most of southern Minnesota and Iowa. If you got a wild oat problem, um, there's no good herbicides to take wild oats out of tame oats. It just doesn't exist. Uh, 15, almost 20 years ago now, Monsanto approached me with a previous employer and said, oh yeah, we can get you a herbicide that will control wild oats in oats. It'll cost you $10 million and it'll take us five years to do it, but we can do it. And oh, by the way, you have to worry about getting it you know, through the EPA and USDA and FDA and, and all that kind of stuff. And I had some bosses that said, oh gee, you know, we're really focusing on Canada. It's a huge problem up there. Let's go ahead and do it. And I sat there and went, let's see here. Now in some of our research nurseries, we're crossing wild oats with tame oats to try to get the protein up and try to find some of those disease you know, genes. No, you know, and nobody has, fortunately. Also, just make it clear, there is no such thing as a GMO oat, okay? It does not exist anywhere in the world and nobody's working on it. This is what crown rust looks like, or leaf rust. At this point in time, if you haven't sprayed it, it's too late, you know. Uh, it is a fungal disease that goes underneath the epidermal area of the leaf and just kills the plant. It chokes out the, uh, the chlorophyll. Again, there are fungicides that work, um, but you gotta hit them early. Okay, harvesting and storage, and I know I'm running a little long on time here, Jim, but I want to point this out. I still like swathing. I do. Um, I think you get a better quality. I think you get a better, uh, not only uniform quality, but just uh, test weight and everything out of swathing the oats if you can do it. Remember though with oats, they dry differently than wheat or barley. Wheat or barley dry from the bottom up, okay? That's why they get, tend to get more fusarium in it because that head stays green and wet. Meanwhile, the stems are drying out and even the head dries from the bottom up. Oats doesn't have that spike, first of all, as a head. It's got what they call a panicle, looks like a Christmas tree. 90% of your yield is in the bottom two thirds of that panicle. Oats dries from the top down. So what you'll see, you'll drive down the road and see those top kernels, which are usually some of the bigger ones, and the glooms on that, which is the outside hull, spread out and dry out. And gee, the birds are gonna come in, you know, and get it, and you'll see that gloom and that kernel hit the ground and farmers panic and go, holy crap, I got, you know, shatter loss, field loss, bird loss, whatever. I need to get out there. The bottom two thirds of that kernel or of that head may still be 20% moisture higher. It's physiologically mature for the most part, but they go, I gotta get out there with a the combine. And then they're unhappy with the test weight, they're unhappy with the grade, they're unhappy with the uh, color of the oats, they're too green, you know. The old rule of thumb that grandpa taught me was when you thought the oats were ripe, you went to the fair for three days and then came home and swathed them. And then, you know, you waited another couple of days until that other material, the straw dried down. Then you go combine and you get a clean oat, and you get a uniform oat, and you get one that stores well, okay? When you, if you swath or whether you direct cut, you've got to get that moisture down and you got to take the moisture on the entire head, not just on those top kernels that shell off fairly quickly. Again, we touched on desiccation, it's legal. There's tolerances, I don't like it. When you desiccate a plant like that, you're doing the same thing as hitting it with a frost. You are rupturing the water cells in it. You are destroying the protein starch bonds. We can tell it when we get the oats to the mill that have been desiccated because instead of dehulling easily, then we size everything and slice it to make flakes it powders up. Why? Because you've desiccated, you've, you've killed the cells in it. And oh, by the way, yeah, you've ruined the germination, which doesn't affect us, but if you're in the seed business, 
you just wiped the yield out or wiped your uh, seed out. Um, try to avoid dehulled kernels. And the way to do that is watch your concave and cylinder speed. Drying, the target for storage of oats is 12 to 13 percent. Bin aeration is necessary. Now, I love the fact that farmers are storing more grain on farm. I really do. You should. You know, you're controlling, you know, your profitability then. But understand, it's not like putting the money in the bank and leaving it. It's the same thing as, you know, that's a living, breathing organism, grain in those bins. It's like taking care of livestock and saying, oh, I got them inside a shelter. This, you know, they'll be fine for a month. No, you got to monitor it, okay? Dr. Uh, uh, Dirk, not Benson, I can't think of his last name right now, from K-State, has done studies for years on grain. He did it while he was at Purdue. And these big, you know, epitomies to profitability, as he calls them, I call them crockpots. Because... I love the fact that they're bigger bins and they're faster, you know, and all this sort of thing. And I got to tell you, I'm a pain in the ass when it comes to farm shows, you know, like the Louisville show that's going on right now and, and the state fair. I love going up and talking to drying companies and combine companies and bin companies. And they'll tell you the efficiency and how many cents, of, you know, it costs per bushel to, to store and to handle and the speeds and the capacities. And I say, okay, have you done any studies on the quality of what are you talking about? You know, we make number two. Well, no, that's not good enough. You know, you need to understand that with the types of temperature changes we've got going on. Remember last week was fairly warm, you know, above freezing. Today it's below zero. Up to a foot inside on the south side of these steel bins, you can have seven degrees Fahrenheit variation during the day tonight, okay? How much temperature change does it take to form water? Seven degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So up to a foot in, you're creating the ideal crock pot for stuff to start germinating, for insects to move in, for deterioration of the grain. I, I, I hesitate to tell you how many farmers that I've dealt with over the years that the grain, corn, wheat, barley, uh, oats, went into the bin fine. Yeah, it was maybe 14, 15 moisture on the oats, or maybe it was up to 18 on the corn. But you know, I let, ran a little air on it. Well, how often did you check the bin? Well, you know, it's on Aunt Sadie's farm, which is seven miles from the home place here. And, I, and there was a lot of snow, and I didn't get over there this winter. But, okay, why are you calling me? Well, I turned the cross auger on, and it won't turn you know, won't move, did it to themselves. You know, you got to monitor that bin weekly at the very minimum, any grain that you're storing. Otherwise, you're asking for trouble. The other big thing that's moving in, and there was demonstrations up here at the fair, grain bags. You know, I grew up on a dairy farm. We called them silage bags for a reason. The grain fermented, you know, or the silage fermented in there. Today, there's companies all over the Midwest here promoting grain bags, the quick and easy, simple solution to harvest efficiency. And that, I'm quoting one of them. Because you can buy this little loader and the grain bag, and for so many cents a bushel, you can just empty the, the grain cart or the combine right into the bag and leave it there. And it's sealed. Yeah, it is. It's meant as temporary storage. The farmers that are letting it lay there all winter, you know, are just asking for trouble. And, by the way, if deer or elk or raccoons or any varmints come along, tear a little bit of hole in there, not only have they created a self-feeder for every critter in 10 miles, they've also started the deterioration of that grain. And we've had farmers, it's just very, very popular up in North Dakota today and in uh, Manitoba. Farmers are all moving this direction. I don't need those big steel tanks and stuff. You know, I can just do a grain bag. And then they're disappointed when their grain gets rejected in the fall or in the spring, particularly. 
Um, I did a study for three years with a farmer in Saskatchewan. He did everything right. He had the oats down to 12 to 13 percent moisture when it went into the bag. He had it right up next to his farm place, so he was kind of controlling the critters, you know, a little bit. He had three bags of oats, three bags of wheat, three bags of barley. We monitored at, at harvest. We monitored one month, three months, six months, and then we had a part of a bag all the way to nine months out. The grain didn't deteriorate at all if it was dry. His neighbor across the road who had grain bags about a quarter of a mile away out in the middle of the field, wet, a little bit wetter grain, didn't dry it before it went in the bag, none of it made milling quality, none of it. And the other thing that was interesting is oats because as TJ said, you know, oats is one of the higher oil small grains. The ravens and the crows picked out every oat bag and left the wheat and barley. They could sense that higher fat content, you know, right through, I don't know how many mill plastic bag. So is there any wonder, you know, why some of this stuff goes bad? Okay, I'm almost ready to wrap up here because I know you, several of you are starting to squirm in the seats and I don't think you're trying to clean the seat. I think nature's calling. So you raise a crop and I want you to raise the most profitable crop possible, the highest net return per acre, not the highest yield necessarily, the highest net return per acre. I think oats fits into that rotation very, very well. You raise a crop, but we're buying an ingredient. I'm not going to take any time to go through this specification. I can go through every step with you and tell you how to improve it, how to work with it. These are not hard to reach at all. Good quality milling oats are generally better than these minimum requirements. But again, there's simple little things like, you know, no live insects. Why? Well, do you want to eat insects? You know, no. Um, 2% foreign material, that's, that's by weight. That's quite a bit of material. You know, that's a, that's a lot of screenings and stuff in it. Heat damage, most heat damage is zero unless the farmer has taken a shortcut and tried to dry the oats a little bit too, you know, too hot. For any food grade grain, corn, barley, wheat, oats, your grain temperature should never get above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't care what the plenum temperature is on the, on the dryer. I don't care what kind of a dryer system it is. You can go to 220 degrees on your plenum temp. But if your grain temp gets over 110, you start changing the enzymatic activity in that grain and it'll deteriorate. Okay. Um, barley, wild oat, wheat contamination's never a problem in this area. Never have rejected any grain for that. So to wrap up, the keys to being a strategic supplier, and that's why we're working with farmers to make them strategic suppliers, understand who the customer is and what drives our decisions to buy. We supply Kellogg's, we supply General Mills, we supply Quaker with food grade ingredients. Okay, we're not a commodity trading group. Yeah, we have a division that if your grain doesn't make human quality, we have traders that will merchandise it into the pet food industry. And I can tell you that pet food industry sometimes has higher standards than the food industry does, you know, particularly around non-GMO and organic. Um, and for our organic growers, we're trying to market your entire crop if you want us to. Because as you know, organic is not a crop, it's a system. It's a rotation. And you need to be able to have a market for every one of those crops in your rotation. Understand our customer's definition of quality. Quality is not number one, number two, number three USDA grade. Those specs are there for nutritional reasons, for milling reasons, for food safety reasons. And you need to understand how you can, and you can do it. You just need to understand the controls that you need to take. Like, I don't want you fumigating the oats unless you've got a licensed certifier that's going to use phosphine gas. You know, don't spray malathion on it, you know, just because you can. You know. 
Understand the differences between a crop and ingredient. Fully understand and document your market, your product, and your capabilities better than your competitors. And you want to know who your competitors are? It's Canada. It's the next state over. It's the next county over. You know, and for the most part, today's farmer has forgotten more about what drives quality than our predecessors did because they tended to sell more into the human food market. Today, we tend to raise commodities. Um, food purchasing is the most year-round thing that you do as a human. You buy food every week, sometimes every day. Grain marketing should also be a year-round process to get the ultimate return per acre. I know one of the questions that's gonna come up is, do you even have a market for oats? You know, well, today, I'm out of the market for nearby, New crop, we're 60 over the SEP, and I think the SEP is around 280, 285, so we'd be 340, 345. I think if you, for a new crop, oats of that quality that I just had up there delivered to St. Ansgar. I think if we would have, take the time to put that into Jim's profitability spreadsheet with the much, much, much lower input cost on oats, and Mac had to step out, I know, but you know, you can buy certified seed for an oat crop for probably 30, 40 bucks an acre versus 411, which I just paid for Pioneer triple stack corn. You know, that's a huge difference in impact input costs. And if you can raise 100 to 150 bushel oats, oats looks a whole lot better today than it did a few years ago. So with that, I'm gonna shut off. And I'll be around all day and tomorrow morning. So if you don't have an immediate question, uh, I know some of you need coffee and other facilities. I'll shut up and uh, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think he said a very important thing is uh, we need to think as growers, the difference between just raising a crop and raising an ingredient that has value and that that's something we all need to think about we're going to take a break here i just want to mention that we are videoing this and it will be historically on our website so if you want to go back later and listen to it uh how's the temperature in the room would you like it is it okay or you want it a little warmer oh, anybody need to have the temperature changed okay all right um what we're going to do is, uh, after the break, I want to introduce our staff, but I think a lot of you want to get up and, and go to the restroom. So let's take about a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back and get started again. Thank you.
DJ, come here.
remember you got to use the Okay, why don't we come back together again, please? Um, are you going to want to hand these? Out? Well, I, I want to introduce our staff. I'm going to wait to, uh, after we get done with this presentation right before lunch. But one of the individuals that had just come on to work with the company is T.J. Cardis. And T.J. Uh, lives in Blooming, uh, Blooming Prairie, Minnesota, not too far from here. And he, over the years, have had a lot of experience with third crop and, and, and cover crops. And probably, uh, besides Elberly Seed House, uh, I think TJ probably has as good a handle on this as anybody, and he's worked real close with Legacy Seeds and several other seed companies to uh, provide to the growers the right type of cover crop seed for the right purpose. So I'm going to turn it over to TJ, 
and uh, he's going to introduce a Andrew, and they'll take us to lunch. All right, thanks, Jim. Yes, yeah, see, Jim told you my name is TJ Cardis. I grew up right here in southern Minnesota, never left the area. Just, I guess I couldn't handle leaving too much of a homeboy. So in that process, we've had a lot of changes on the farm I grew up on, and we'll, I'll do over more of those in pre presentations this afternoon and tomorrow. But one fortunate thing I had in my lifetime is I got to work with Legacy Seeds out of Wisconsin, and they have a gentleman on staff by the name of Dave Robinson. And Dave has probably forgotten more about cover crops than I know. And another person they brought on board was Andrew Heath. And Andrew just got out of college a few years ago from Iowa State and has been just instrumental with pushing this forwards. And he and I work together very well. Uh, he's the DSM, and I work under him as a, as a pro seller part of the time. And Andrew and I get along really well, and we both bring a good message on cover crops and, and dealing with one solid source of seed and information and management techniques. So we're going to go through a short presentation. Andrew Heath and myself, Andrew from Legacy Seeds, and myself, TJ Cardis. So we'll start out and get rolling here. Yep, grab that one. All right, like uh, TJ said, my name is Andrew Heath. I um, actually come from the La Crosse, Wisconsin area. Um, I cover southwestern Wisconsin, southern Minnesota, and uh, northern Iowa, northern Illinois for Legacy Seeds. Um, obviously, I do have a little bit of experience with cover crops, otherwise Jim would not have asked me to talk, or at least I wouldn't think he would. So, um, but I gained a lot of that experience here in 2013 with a lot of the prevented plant acres that uh, were around the area, especially in the northern area that I cover. But uh, I'll start out a little bit with um, a little introduction. Um, I've already talked about myself, babbled about myself enough, but uh, I'll introduce you to Legacy Seeds. Um, we're actually an independent, family-owned, Wisconsin-based company. Our headquarters is in Scandinavia, Wisconsin. I got a map coming up there because it's about a town of 300 people. Um, in Wisconsin, we judge town sizes by how many bars there are in the town. And it's only a, it's only a one-bar town, so if you don't know where it's at, you ain't going to stumble upon it. So it's not rated very high in Wisconsin. <laughs> That's what he's trying to get across. It's not a stopping point. So um, overall, we're a very young company. Started in 1999 and 2000. Uh, we actually started as an alfalfa breeding company, so that's something that's a little different than most seed companies out there. Um, and to this day, we're the only independently owned alfalfa breeding company in North America. And due to the employee, employee agreement that I signed when they hired me, I'm required to say that at least twice in every presentation. So we are the only independently owned alfalfa breeding program in North America. Something that we're very proud of, that we really hang our hat on. Obviously, being a Wisconsin-based company, it's a big part of the market there. He's so, getting his bonus now, too, <laughs> so he's got it all set. It's on tape. <laughs> so um, here a couple of years ago, we introduced the Earth Builder brand of cover crops. Um, and all this information that I just rattled off here is available on our website at LegacySeeds.com. I also have a booth set up or a table set up in the back with more information as well. So um, here we are today, it's Albert Lee, Minnesota. Um, I'm from the La Crosse area, and this is where Scandinavia is at. So it's around the Stevens Point area. But you can see um, we're a very northwest or very northern Midwest based company. Um, we have a very good focus for Wisconsin in particular, but as well as the surrounding states. Our market area. Um, goes over to the to Michigan, um, some into Ohio and Indiana, but then Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. So you can see very focused um, for the cropping systems that are involved in that geography. So I believe that that's a great advantage of, of our company. So on to the meat and potatoes. Um, the outline of what we'll cover today will define, define a cover crop, the benefits of the cover crop, um, hopefully answer the question, why would you utilize a cover crop? And then some things to consider well, um, when implementing cover crops into a corn and soybean rotation specifically. Um, and then lastly and most importantly, will cover crops work in, in the upper Midwest? So, so this picture actually is from um, spring of 2013. Uh, this is uh, as far north as I cover around the Hickston Black River Falls area in Wisconsin. Uh, this gentleman here, he is a very... Um, opinionated vocal guy, uh, but this is actually um, sorghum sudan grass, or sudan grass, excuse me, just sudan grass that was planted after some prevented plant. Um, we've got, we got over 60 inches of growth in about 45 days. So it took off very quickly um, and tell you what, 
he was not he was um, so proud to have me ask him to stand by that to take his picture so this is the ideal cover crop very big very visual um, but also doing a lot for the soil which we'll get into more so um, this one the picture on the left here is also a cover crop but it's one that Dwayne, the gentleman in the first picture, would say, oh, well, my cover crop's bigger. So obviously it's not as big, um, big a top growth, but it's, but it's doing a lot of good and a lot of benefit to the soil. And we'll touch some more on that. Uh, then the rock star of the cover crop world is obviously the radish, the one that gets most publicity, the one with a lot of marketing dollars behind it. Um, we'll touch more on that as well. So um, this is actually a forage mix uh, that uh, was utilized. Um, so there is a way to get mo multiple benefits from um, cover crops. So being a young guy that I am, uh, when I first started wanting to learn more about cover crops, so what did I do? Went to Google, punched in cover crops. Google has all the answers. Um, so it's defined as a crop planted to prevent soil erosion and to pro provide humus. Uh, good, good definition, pretty general. Um, then uh, Concise Encyclopedia defines it as fast growing crop planted to prevent soil erosion, increase nutrients in the soil, and provide organic matter. Cover crops are grown either in the, in the season during um, which cash crops are not grown or between the rows of some crops. So with that, I'm done. You know all you need to know. That's a damn good uh, um, definition and really hits a lot of key points. So I'm kidding. You're not going to get off that easily. So. So now that we know what a cover crop is, why, why would you want to utilize them on your operation? What is the benefits? Um, so obviously, uh, first and foremost, they improve soil health. Um, soil health, is, one good definition that I found of it is the capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem. So that really um, defines soil as the ecosystem that we're all living in, but on a smaller scale. I believe that that's a really good way to look at the soil um, more as a living organism and a functioning ecosystem rather than just dirt on the floor. Um, and especially in Wisconsin where I come from where uh, quote unquote soil is hard to come by. Um, in some of the regions, mostly it's limestone and gravel that uh, farmers are trying to farm. Um, another big benefit is uh, reduced erosion. So this sign in the picture here is actually um, from it's actually around Plover, Wisconsin uh, on uh, Interstate 39 in the Central Sands region. So this is a big four lane highway. And as, if you can't read it in the back, it says watch for dust over the road next five miles. So how big of a problem does it need to be? How many times did that dust need to blow over the road and congest traffic, cause accidents before they had to put a sign up? That's my question. So it's obviously a very big issue in, those, in that region. And uh, cover crops is a great way to um, com combat the soil erosion. How many, how many of you can think of an area in your region that this sign wouldn't pertain to? Everybody's got that farm that blows away and the guy just won't change how he's farming it. That's just what he's going to do. My dad did it, my grandfather did it, and I'm not changing. No way can you make me change. When the state has to put this sign up, that's also a sign that we need to maybe make some small changes somewhere. So everybody in this room can probably sit down and go, yep, I can think of a farm where this applies or area my, where I live. I could drive an area where I could find this, where this sign should be put up. And that's not good. We need to change that. Uh, another very big and very um, well-known advantage to cover crops is reduced compaction. Um, I believe that's because that's one of the areas that we can easily measure with tools like a penetrometer that's sitting up here. Um, we can very easily see that in a soil pit. So it's something that uh, we really take comfort in knowing that we're reducing that and we can see it and measure it. Um, increased water and nutrient holding capacity both of those translate back to organic matter, which we'll talk about more a little bit later. Um, and then increased uh, earthworm populations. So uh, the one line that I always remember with uh, on the earthworms is I had a younger gentleman, I believe he was like in middle school age, we'll say, he said, told me, he said, well, you know, if earthworms want to live in the soil, it must be a pretty good home for them. So if the earthworms are living there, if they want to be there, if they're inhabiting it, it's going to be a healthier soil and it's um, going to really benefit you in the end. So um, some more benefits of cover crops, uh, improve soil aeration and percolation, reduce runoff, 
um, reduce nutrient loss um, to groundwater. Like uh, Jim had mentioned earlier in his opening, the amount of uh, nutrients, specifically nitrogen, that's being lost through tile lines is astronomical, to say the least. So anything we can do to, um, to decrease and prevent that is all the better. Uh, increase or improve soil biology and soil diversity. Um, with the monoculture that has become the corn soybean rotation, anytime we can introduce another species into the rotation, into the soil, into the environment, we're gonna improve it. Um, and also improve no-till performance. So here's a good uh, flow chart, if you will, from, I believe this is from the NRCS, um, that shows all everything that I just talked about as far as the benefits of cover crops, but in a much more pleasing way, and you don't have to listen to me babble about this one. But one thing I will point out is, uh, you look at the enhanced soil structure, increased soil organic matter and environmental quality, and they're all inter intertwined and connected some way or another. So it's not just one thing that you're gonna improve, you're not gonna go out there and just reduce compaction. There's gonna be a lot of benefits to implementing a system like this on your farm. So um, now we get into the things that you need to consider uh, before you start to implement this uh, cover crops into a corn and soybean rotation especially. So first and foremost, cover crop selection um, as far as uh, species, mixes, disease bridges, seed selection, all things you gotta take into account. The management side we'll touch on as well as the application method. So species selection. The first question I always ask anyone that's interested in cover crops is, what are you looking to accomplish? What is your end goal? And I'll tell this quick little story, but I was actually in a, at a field day in uh, Northern Illinois. I had an older gentleman approach me afterwards and he asked me, he said, so could I utilize radishes in a turf setting? And I'm thinking in my head, why? why? What's, what's behind this? And I got talking to him, asked him some more questions. He wanted to know how how well the radishes would tolerate close mowing. I'm thinking it still isn't adding up to, you know, in my head and I finally just came right out and asked him, I said, what do you do and what are you looking to gain from this? And he said, well, I actually maintain a lot of cemeteries and we have a very big problem with compaction. And he wanted to know if the radishes would tolerate that close mowing and the upkeep of the cemeteries. And then his next question was, well, the roots don't go down more than six feet, do they? <laughs> so it was uh, very interesting to talk to the gentleman, uh, but as you can see, he was looking to break up that compaction layer, um, wasn't really interested in the soil health um, very much, but uh, just a kind of a different situation that I've encountered. So, um, And then how will cover crops fit into your current management system? Um, obviously, I'm not very old. I don't have a ton of experience. Um, but one thing I do know, and I do know for certain, that farmers do not like change. They like to keep things the same. Like TJ had mentioned earlier, whether it was because of their dad or their grandpa or whoever had done it that way for many, many years, uh, it's very difficult to persuade a producer to make many changes within one growing season. So um, if we can implement cover crops and utilize their benefits in a system that the farmer is currently using, all the better. Um, as far as that management system, the herbicide program is a big, big uh, factor, and I'll touch more on that here in the next slide, I believe. Um, the crops being raised, obviously I'm going to focus more on the corn soybean rotation and how we implement cover crops into that rotation. Um, the characteristics of the species that you're selecting, especially whether or not they overwinter, and um, the residue management side of it. So. Um, the location as far as uh, how far north you are, the growing season also has a big effect and along with that, the seeding time. So um, as far as the cover crop species selection, uh, I don't really want to get too much into that because that's what TJ will be covering a lot of tomorrow. Uh, but one tool I do want to point you guys towards is the Midwest Cover Crop Council. Um, they have a great tool. It's called the Cover Crop Decision Tool. And this is just a screenshot of it. Uh, you go to their website, it's, uh, well, again, you just Google Midwest Cover Crop Council, um, and it'll take you right there. But um, in this, at this site, you can uh, enter in your information as far as the location, the county, cash crop, planting date, harvest date, as well as what you're looking to achieve um, in 
in utilizing this cover crop. So it's a very good tool. Um, it really, I, I don't like to think of it this way, but if you use it correctly, it could make my job obsolete. So if you could stumble around on it, don't get too proficient in using it, please. So this is, after you enter all that information, this is the chart that uh, the website will generate for you. Obviously, it has a lot of species on uh, the left side here, and it ranks those uh, based on the goals that you selected earlier. So you can see some of them are better nitrogen scavengers or erosion fighters than others. Um, as for the bulk of the chart here, this is actually a calendar across the top. It has the dates, and then these green bars is when each corresponding species grows, essentially, um, where it is adding you, giving you the most benefit. The shaded blue area in here is when your crop is in the field. So as you can see here, one very big challenge that I face on a regular basis, and um, especially in this area and as I move further north, is that the crop is in the field all the time while any of these cover crop species really thrive and grow. So that's one big hurdle that, uh, that we, we need to overcome, and we'll touch a little bit on that here in a few minutes as far as some different ways to uh, overcome that challenge. So um, seed source selection. This is very important, um, and actually I, I'd had a, pitch, a couple pictures up here. I don't know if, where they exactly went out into cyberspace, but that's all right. Um, so the first one, first, uh, topic of this that I want to talk about is bin run versus certified. So um, obviously a seed company, we make money off selling seed, but uh, take that with a grain of salt with what I'm going to say next. And I know for a fact that this is an experience of a producer in the room uh, where there were bin run oats that were bought from who knows where, um, and there was Roundup Ready canola in along with the oats. They weren't cleaned property, properly, um, wasn't certified seed. So, um, Brad, what was that herbicide that you used to get the, uh, the Roundup Ready canola out of there? Oh, I, I, I was thought you were going to rattle off the names of the, uh, of the high school students that you hired to go out and pull it by hand. <laughs> you just want to embarrass them. So, they're out there working pretty hard. My, my, my point in this being is that with bin run um, products, you never really know exactly what you're getting. Um, and especially in a case like that, that was probably one of the worst case scenarios with the Roundup Ready canola, uh, because think of all the other Roundup Ready crops that we have, other corn, soybeans, which make up a lot of the rotation, especially in this area. And then you throw alfalfa into the mix there as well. Well, that's a good point too, when we bring that up is, some of the seeds, like when you take rape, rape is kind of a general, general terminology, it's actually a canola plant. So if you start buying rape seed that's not variety stated, that you don't know it's dwarf Essex rape, you could be buying canola, and you could be buying Roundup Ready canola. Now, you put that in for a cover crop, it worked great, did what it wanted to do, but it went to seed, or you had some hard seed left over. Now, you next year, you put in corn or soybeans, and you got canola out there. Well, now you've defeated the purpose of what you're doing, because now you've, now you've started a weed growing. Now, you make a call to me, I have to call Andrew, we have to come out, and you get to scream at us for a while, and that's, that's not where we want to be in this. We don't want to be yelled at. We want to hear how good it works, but there's times it doesn't always work out like we'd planned. And a lot of it comes from where did the seed get sourced from? Well, I bought some here because, well, I got it a couple cents cheaper. That's fine. I don't, I don't tell anybody because, I mean, it's expensive and money's money. But we got to make sure we don't have, spend more money down the road taking care of something that we started. So the, the bin run and the certified is really a big part of what we're doing. Now, if you raise your own oats, and clean them and use them back or barley or rye, no problem. You know what you got. But you buy something from somebody in northern Minnesota or South Dakota or North Dakota, you're, you're not exactly sure when you get variety not stated or variety not stated hybrids. So that really leads me right into the next bullet point there, um, a PVP versus a VNS uh, on, um, crop or species that you're buying. So um, anyone in here know what VNS stands for? I'll give you a hint, it's not very nice seed. It actually stands for variety not stated or very nasty seed in some cases. So um, the biggest culprit, I guess uh, you could say, um, the, yeah, the biggest culprit within the cover crop world um, in this, on this topic would be the radish side of it especially. 
Um, like I said earlier, the radish is really the crop that, or the species that has a lot of momentum behind it, a lot of marketing dollars behind it, and it's really the, uh, the poster child of the cover crop world. Um, the VNS side of it, um, what, what that does, it just spins the roulette wheel, if you will, as far as the performance that you're going to get in the maturity, which I'll touch on here in a little bit, um, the maturity especially and the performance of the crop. So those are two things when you're, when we're looking to implement cover crops into a rotation, we want to eliminate as many variables as we can, especially this far north where Mother Nature can wreak havoc on us any day. Um, so in eliminating one of those variables would be to eliminate the variety not stated seed. So that is very important, especially um, from a seed company standpoint, because uh, a lot of times, whether it was our problem or not, we're called out to to clean up the mess, if you will. So um, as far as the species maturity, um, the radish is also another good culprit to pick on here um, with this one. Uh, 2013, did any of you have prevented plant? Anyone in the room here had to deal with it? So say um, you went out there right away after, when, once you could get back on that soil and you planted some cover crops. Um, middle of August rolls around, you're driving by, you see all these pretty little white flowers out in the field. You're thinking, boy, I did a good job planting that cover crop. Look at it working out there. It's just doing a great job. Well, the reality of it is that those little white flowers are going to seed. Once the radish seed especially, uh, once it uh, reaches physiological maturity, it can stay viable in the soil for 30 to 50 years. So once you start seeing those little white flowers, I would recommend either going to see a lawyer and drawing up your will and putting that in your will to your children, grandchildren, that they can expect radishes for the next 30 to 50 years. Or you go, you get a stock chopper, uh, mower, anything to shred those tops to set that plant back um, to prevent it from, from um, finishing flowering and finishing developing those seeds. Um, another, oh. Well, and just because you've seen those heads exposed, and we saw that in some of our fields, and we got out there and, and managed them and took care of them. Just because the white flower is showing up doesn't mean that the seed is viable at that point. It's the ones that went to, that formed white heads in the middle of August, and they didn't do anything, and by the end of September, they got viable seed. So it's a management. You have to really learn management of, it's a crop. It's a crop no matter if it's corn, soybeans, oats, wheat, barley, cover crops, it's a crop. It's got that in its name, and it has to be managed accordingly. The white heads are, yeah, you need to go do something, but it not, just because you see a white head doesn't mean, oh, now you got seed out there. If you manage it properly, it doesn't have to be an issue. So um, with that being said, uh, and after talking about the PVP, the VNS, this um, species maturity, I'll just give a little plug here um, to our Legacy Seeds pile driver radish. Um, all this, these cover crop guides are available in the back there, so um, feel free to pick one up. It's less stuff I gotta bring home with me then. Uh, but the pile driver radish is a PVP. It's a late maturing radish, um, so you get more consistent performance, more consistent maturity, um, so it can eliminate one of those variables and make it much easier to manage like uh, TJ had alluded to there. So. So um, next on to the management side of, of the cover crops, especially in a corn soybean rotation, one of the biggest uh, questions or one of the most common questions I get on the cover crop side is, so if I plant radishes or clover, I, I don't have to put down nitrogen, right? And that's um, one of the big myths um, about cover crops that I've encountered. Like, uh, like Jim had said in the introduction with Gabe Brown and the system that he has in place in North Dakota, obviously a very extensive and a very good system that's been working for a very long time. Um, the first couple of years implementing this uh, cover crops into a corn and soybean rotation especially, I would not recommend cutting your nitrogen rates at all. So one more time, I wouldn't recommend cutting your nitrogen rates at all after utilizing cover crops for one, two, even three years. So the main reason behind that is that the nitrogen that is uh, scavenged and fixed by cover crops isn't readily available. It isn't like you're going out there spreading urea or um, putting down 28%. It's not gonna be there right away for the crop, for the following cash crop, I should say. Um, it's a slow release. It's actually uh, a lot of the nitrogen that is fixed and scavenged by cover crops is in the organic matter of the soil. It takes a while for that cash crop to uh, be able to utilize 
that nutrient. So that's one big one big misnomer that um, I always like to try to get get in front of. But that being said, in the same breath, in our cover crop guide, um, some of our mixes, one of the first things that they'll state about the mix is that it can fix or scavenge up to 200 pounds of nitrogen. So I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth right now and everyone's laughing at me in the room, but trust me, that's um, nitrogen that isn't readily available, that isn't gonna um, be available to the cash crop right away. But obviously, it's a great uh, a great selling point, and nitrogen's a good good one to go after because of the cost. And uh, you sound like a politician. Oh boy, here we go. Who are gave you, him a microphone? Are you, are you running for house or senate, or what are you running <laughs> for? Here? So, um, the next one that I just want to talk to, uh, touch on as far as fertility is uh, the phosphorus, especially um, buckwheat is. Thought, thought to. Uh, I don't believe that there's a lot of studies out there supporting this, so I won't spend much time on it. Uh, but phosphor, or buckwheat is believed to make phosphorus in the soil more available. Um, Dave Robison, like TJ had uh, mentioned earlier, is our cover crop manager, cover crop product manager. He's from uh, Winona Lake, Indiana. I'll talk more about him here in a minute. But um, he claims that uh, there are spots where he had cover crop plots uh, 15 years ago where he can still walk right to the spot where the buckwheat was because it makes it um, the plants are darker green healthier so just something that I want to point out to you that it's not necessarily only on the on the nitrogen side of fertility that cover crops are beneficial another another thing I would just want to mention quickly is on the fertility and the nutrient side of it especially um, how how much of the ground are we farming now how deep are you guys tilling 18, 12 inches, you know. So by utilizing cover crops, especially tubers and brassicas that seem, that penetrate deep, and even grasses and legumes where their roots will penetrate deeper into the soil profile, they're taking up nutrients deeper in that soil profile and relocating it. In the case of a tuber or brassica, they're relocating it in the bulb, or in the case of a legume into the crown of, of that uh, that plant. So what you're doing is you're taking a lot of that nutrients that you weren't utilizing before, that ground, that soil that you weren't farming, deeper in the profile and bringing it up. And now instead of farming eight to 12, 16 inches, you're farming 38, 42 inches. So you're utilizing a lot more of that nutrients and the resources deeper into that soil profile as well. And that's something we saw in the preventive plant year if farms have been worked and they didn't get planted, we put in the radishes. As the radish tuber goes down, it'll kink. And where it kinks at is the hard pan, the first hard pan it hits. We had farms that within three inches of the surface, the radishes kinked. That meant that field cultivator put a hard pan in because it was wet when they worked the ground. Now they didn't, they didn't intend doing that. That wasn't their plan, but that's what happened. So that kinked. Well, when your corn roots hit that, they're not as, they're not as uh, aggressive as, as a radish. They go sideways. Well, at that point, they're not getting down any more water. They're not getting down any more nutrients. They're just going sideways. Well, pretty soon they run in other corn plant roots, and that's where they sit. So part of the idea of percolating this ground or getting this deeper penetration is after the radishes, the corn roots, because of the radish roots going down, will, will actually go down deeper also. Plus the earthworm channels. Earthworms love radishes, love brassicas, so they, they channel down deeper. So now you got roots going farther down in the profile, and there's water, there's nutrients, there's mineralization down there that we can tap into to make a better quality grain and a healthier plant. Well said. Um, another, <laughs> another very big uh, factor in the management of cover crops that I've encountered is the chemical programs that are in place, especially on a corn soybean rotation. Uh, we're always looking to have a residual there to take care of uh, whether it's winter annual weeds, things along those lines, whether it's um, a pre-emerge herbicide, things like that. So while introducing another crop, cover crops, especially into this rotation that uh, has become very roundup centric, we'll say, um, is, is difficult and especially in a prevented plant year like 2013 I had a very difficult time um, and was limited on some of my options as far as cover crops on certain acres because of the herbicide program that was already in use um, so and especially pre-emerge herbicides so um, I do have some guys that are working on their own uh, studies if you will 
of herbicides and how they how they affect cover crops and obviously radishes are, are a big one as well as uh, cereal rye um, but really there hasn't been much research uh, from the from the industry standpoint or university standpoint to support or nullify any of this yet but with uh, University of Wisconsin Extension just came out with this publication here um, and I believe TJ's got more copies of it, but it is uh, called Herbicide Rotation Restrictions and Forage and Cover Crop Cover Cropping Systems. So this is probably about the best document that I've encountered to um, show you the uh, whether or not you can utilize cover crops, what species you can utilize based on the herbicide program, and vice versa. So um, in <laughs> Otherwise, if I would not have that document, I would stand up here and say, shake my finger at all of you, just like every other, you know, um, every other rep out there and say, read your labels, read your labels. Um, obviously, I know that farmers don't like to do that, um, and they do what they do, they're routine creatures of habit. So um, this is a very good resource to um, make me not shake my finger and say, read your labels, because when I do say that, it normally ends up into me reading their labels and telling them uh, what they want to hear, what they can or can't do. So, Well, we had another spot too last year, Andrew and I ran into this. We had some hail in western Minnesota. We had a couple producers call us and say, okay, the crop insurance has totaled the field. It's done. We'd like to do something. Well, they had a beef producer close and he said, you know, I'll buy all the forage off this farm because you're not going to, you get, your insurance is paid, it's done. When we looked at the label, the herbicides they used, there was nothing we could actually put on that farm until, well, some of it the next spring. One farm, it was late in the fall, we couldn't give them any benefit. We couldn't have done anything for them, which was too bad because they'd gotten paid from insurance, it was done, the crop was totaled out, it was finished, and there was like a thousand acres that they could have put a forage crop on or an earlier cover crop. The herbicide program they used, that would have been a train wreck. We'd have sold them seed and it would have been, a, it'd have been Dennis. Sonic was yep. one of it, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, that thing's brutal. So. And that's what Bruce talking about going back into the next year. We need to really address this too because that had a label on it, if I remember right, mm -hmm. of wheat and oats for 13 months. Yep. So, uh, sorghum sedan. Sorghum sedan. sedan. Was, was I mean, it was that as well. It works really well. Don't get me wrong. It's great. It takes care of bean problems. But if you're going to go into anything the next year or a cover crop into it. You're going to spend money and you're going to be mad at us because our seed didn't work. Well, part, why, part of the reason our seed didn't work is there was a herbicide there that was meant to take care of those problems and it did its job. You know, so we got we to gotta really tailor make this. It's got to be a plan from one, two, three, five years on up of what we're doing in a herbicide program. We don't want you to stop a herbicide program. We just got to make sure we know what we're doing so we say the correct stuff. I don't want to say something's not going to work. I really don't because that doesn't do any good for the industry. So I'll just quickly mention this. Uh, this picture up here is actually of corn planted into a cover crop. You can see a lot of the burn down residue here around, but uh, you can see in between the rows here, especially there's uh, radishes that are coming back through. So uh, this, this particular instance did not have a pre-emerge or a residual um, herbicide program um, associated with it. But I just want to point out that um, anytime when you're introducing another crop into a corn and soybean rotation, especially, um, you always want to be aware and ready for an escape. Um, I would not call this an escape yet because this escape is a negative, negative, you know, word. But um, this, obviously, if this would not be contained and if this was throughout the entire field, this would become an issue in a in a very big way. So um, that's always something to be aware of and be, to be ready to remedy. Um, so, just another thing about cover crops that. Uh, and a lot of the fame and fashion and magazine articles that you all have probably read about it, it's something that a lot of people leave out because it can be something that'll scare a lot of producers. So um, as far as another management implication of cover crops is your cash crop selection. Obviously I've been babbling a lot and focusing a lot on corn soybean rotation. Um, in this neck of the woods, southern Minnesota especially, it's difficult to find a um, diversified crop rotation, we'll say, whether that's utilizing corn silage, wheat, um, or even uh, alfalfa for that matter. Um, or over on the other side of the river in Wisconsin, that uh, 
it's more common, but uh, there's still a lot of the same hurdles to clear. So um, in your cash crop selection, uh, obviously the corn silage the wheat and wheat give us the biggest opportunity to utilize cover crops in that rotation uh, because it gives us an extended window to establish the cover crops, get them to utilize as, as much light and resources and as much of the growing season as we can. Um, soybeans also present a better opportunity than corn in a lot of instances, and we'll get to that in a little bit here with the um, application methods. Um, some changes or some alterations to the cash crop that I've seen made uh, to, to accommodate cover crops is shortening up the maturity of whether it's corn or soybeans, um, things like that. I've seen that with mixed success. I'm not going to stand here and tell you guys all that you need to be planting 92-day corn because that way you'll be able to plant cover crops and because I sell the 92-day corn too. That doesn't always work. So um, at, it takes a lot of knowledge and experience to be able to uh, be able to shorten that crop maturity without sacrificing yield and overall profit per acre. So, uh, but that is one, one way that I have had producers uh, accommodate cover crops as well. So um, getting into the application methods a little bit more, um, obviously the, the, there's a lot of different options out there. You're probably well aware of a lot of the options that are there, um, but I'll just start from a basic level and build up from there. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to blurt them out, throw something at me, um, make funny faces at TJ, whatever you need to do to get our attention. But um, the, the most basic cover crop application method is obviously um, drilling or direct seeding. This seems to be the most reliable way. Uh, you're getting that seed to contact with the soil. Given that there's mo uh, available moisture in the soil, uh, this is your best chance to get that seed germinated. Um, one drawback, I guess you could say, is the time needed uh, to, to uh, plant or to seed, in, to seed a field. Obviously, there needs to be a button in the seed of that tractor um, to make this all work. And, one thing that farmers do not really take into account is their time and their um, the value of their time when looking at implementing cover crops and looking at the bottom line of it. So, We drilled a lot in 2013 on the preventive plant acres and I think Brad was to the point of being tired of drilling cover crops by the end of August into September. In fact, I think if I'd have brought one more farm he'd have told me no that's it we're done with this but We've gone back and we've done that after sweet corn, after a, you know, like a summer crop, like you said, you oats or something like this. This would be a great way to do it because it gives you more diverse opportunities to use other mixes. And Andrew will talk about that in aerial application. But here, what we found out is, if we stopped the drill for more than an hour, the radishes came up through the drill because we had such good seed to soil contact, as long as there was moisture there, we had to have moisture but they grew fast. We had one farm that we drilled and right across the fence line, they worked it, they blew it on with an airflow with some Pell lime, they rolled it in, and maybe in about two and a half weeks, you could see it coming up and ours came up in four days. So that made a big difference because we had temperature, we had moisture, we had seed to soil contact. With the other way, yeah, it worked. I'm not saying it didn't work, but it wasn't as efficient and they didn't get as much growth and benefit out of that cover crop as we did. The other thing is, is we could implement peas which work really well as a legume. We could implement some different ideas. Fava beans are ones that we're looking at now putting into it, but those all have to be drilled. They cannot be aerial applied, it just won't work. And here's where I tell you all about the disclaimer that I had to sign speaking with TJ. Um, obviously the radishes did not grow up under the drill, but like you said, it really helps to establish that crop quickly. And really? No, you're just wrecked all that. No, I had, it, I had them all sold on that, Andrew. Now you had to give your disclaimer again. I, I can't take you anywhere. Um, so one of the other very common methods is um, floater, spinner, spreader, airflow seeding. Um, this is a very versatile um, application method. Um, like TJ just mentioned, on the pea side of it especially, we can be limited to the species that we utilize in the system because peas really need to have that seed to soil contact in order to germinate. Um, some of the lighter species as well, um, depending on the environmental conditions, could um, be limited in this application method because of patterning, like I'd mentioned there. Um, the versatility of the spinner spreaders airflows really comes in the fact that 
you don't always need to wait until the crops out of the field to spread them and to get that cover crop um, established and that goes back to the chart that I was talking about earlier from the Midwest Cover Crop Council getting that cover crop established well the cash crop is in the field is vital especially in this geography and as we continue to move further north so this is one way to really maximize the growing season and the the heat units that are there later in the growing season one thing I'd like to comment to on carriers fertilizer in my mind personal opinion don't ever use it if if you're going to have it blended at a plant and brought out in a tender and it sits in that tender for three to four hours before it's spread there's a lot of salt in urea and potash and and, uh, and phosphorus so it, it's harder on the seed plus the spread pattern isn't it's, everything doesn't always fly the same way we saw that my uncle did an experiment this year and we had some problems with that pell lime works outstanding everybody can use a little more calcium pell lime is a really good use the co-ops or fertilizer people love pell lime because it blends really easy it flows well through the spinner spreaders through the floaters that is a really good option to use and it's very very easy on the seed so if you're going to do this and you're going to blow it on i know everybody will say well i can do it with fertilizer application works perfect you might not get as good a stand with your cover crop and now once again we've defeated what we're trying to do pell lime is a, is a much better use i feel personal opinion Floor dry is not a good one either. We've heard of floor dry being used, yeah. or bentonite, which is floor dry. That's it's kind of it's it's like a double-edged sword. Yeah, it's good for flowability, but it sucks moisture away from everything. So you're not you're not gaining. You're gaining and losing at the same day. So I'm, I don't want to do that one step forward, two step back business. Probably one of the more more common uh, cover crop application methods, especially one that's gotten a lot of publicity in a lot of the uh, magazines and things like that, is aerial application. Whether that's utilizing a airplane um, or a helicopter, I've seen both done. I've seen both done with great success. I've seen both done and have them be catastrophic failures as well. So um, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you guys that everything that I'm telling you will work. It all needs to be about uh, how it fits into your management system and how you utilize it. Um, but some things to keep in mind when utilizing aerial application is species selection, a lot like the airflow or the spinners, um, the peas and uh, species that really need a lot of seed to soil contact in order to germinate will not work with aerial application. Obviously, the airplane's flying over, just dropping it, and it's just sitting right on the ground. Um, another, another very important factor is um, so soil moisture and moisture in the environment um, with that seed laying on top of the ground it's not going to have as much seed to soil contact so more moisture is needed to germinate that seed um, seeding rates is another thing um, obviously uh, the plane this plane here in the picture i believe uh, flies and seeds at around uh, 85 or 90 miles an hour when it's going across the field and that's um, obviously going pretty slow for the plane but um, there is other factors that can affect how much seed actually gets to the ground, whether that's wind, whether that's pilot air, whether that's seed getting caught up in the whirls of the plant. Um, so uh, another thing that I will mention it in the great debate between planes versus helicopters, um, I've asked both pilots, pilots of both, whether or not they'll fly on and seed on to contour strips. I got the same response from both of them. They both laughed. <laughs> So it's obviously very difficult um, in my world where I come from on the other side of the river and a lot of the driftless area contour strips are the way of life. So um, it kind of throws a wrench in the plan over there, not being able to utilize aerial application to, to see contour strips. Uh, the other big topic I want to cover with aerial application, a lot like spinner spreaders and what I had mentioned there where you can establish the cover crop well, the cash crop is in the field to utilize as much that growing season as possible. That is the sole purpose and the really the, the biggest um, advantage to using aerial application is to seed the cover crop well that cash crop is in the field and to utilize as much of that growing season as we can. Now, um, where I have seen the most, most failures with aerial application, it was a timing issue. It wasn't necessarily, not, not always the pilot's fault, um, but it was a lot of the timing issue. Obviously, when we're looking to grow two crops in the same field in the same space at the same time, resources are going to be limited. The biggest resources that uh, the cover crop needs to establish itself is moisture and sunlight. 
So um, on the corn side of things, I would not recommend um, aerial application before the corn, the corn plant is dry to the ear leaf. Um, another standard recommendation that they make as far as timing is when there's 50% light penetration through the canopy to the, to the um, soil between the rows. So that one's obviously a lot harder to measure. Um, dry up to the ear leaf is an easier one to measure. Uh, in the dairy world, I always say if you chop it or when it's at the maturity to chop it for corn silage, you can fly it on. It's just a general rule of thumb, but that is a very um, narrow window, I guess you could say, and crucial to establishing the cover crop and the success of the cover crop later down the road. So that's just something that I want to point out to you. And in our um, seed guide, the back couple pages, there are recommendations as far as timing and mixes um, for different application methods and different uh, cropping systems and um, things like that. One thing I'll mention on that too is her or hybrid selection also can be a major part of this. If you have a very, like a like a dual purpose or a silage specific hybrid that is very tall, multiple leaves above the ear, you got a lot more canopy over the row and to get that down through there takes a lot more. We've, we've, we've run into some train wrecks in southeastern Minnesota where they've gone in with a Hagee, they've gone in aerial, gone in a twin row and had absolutely no luck and usually the reason is it was silage variety corn. So I'm not saying you can't do it in a silage variety corn, I'm just saying that we might have to look at some different methods of application for that. You might want to go right for the chopper, yes. Andrew has, yeah. Um, I haven't done studies especially, but I do have producers that are running 22 and 15 inch rows and aerial, aerial applying cover crops. And not to poke holes in TJ's argument, but uh, one of the best uh, catches of an establishments of cover crops that I've ever seen was into a uh, 14 foot tall silage hybrid that was planted in 15 inch rows. And if I remember right, the planting population was around 35, 36,000. So that really kind of boils down, in my opinion and from my experience, obviously, if you've talked to one farmer, you've talked to one farmer. So it always varies as far as the, um, the environment that you're going into. But um, I believe that the timing is, is very crucial, uh, but there are other factors that can, can affect the, the we, establishment We did well. experiments this year in southern Minnesota, right up the road here about 10 miles, on twin row corn and twin row soybeans and drilled in soybeans and flew into there and had outstanding luck. And that was twin row corn. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, if you got a pivot, this thing's a slam dunk, fly it on, run the pivot around, you got her going. But not everybody has pivots, you know, so I mean, you gotta, gotta kind of look at it, but we've, we've done stuff. The only reason I brought that up about the variety side of it and the silage side of it is we always have one person come to us and say, yep, I tried it one time, I tried it in the silage corn, I tried it a week before they're gonna chop it, and by the time they chopped it and came off, it was a train wreck and I'm never doing that again. All right, well, what did you try to fly on? Well, the one guy we found out he flew annual rye on. Well, annual rye is different than cereal rye, but everybody rye's rye. No, rye's not rye, it's all different. That's annual rye grass. It's lighter, it's harder to fly on, you need it in a mix. Not that we haven't made it, made it work, we made it work in southern Minnesota this year, but we got to have a pilot that understands that goes back to the pilots again. So it's, every train wreck we find, we can go back and figure out why that didn't probably work like they thought it should work. Plus it could have been just too dry. I mean, if mother nature doesn't give us any moisture, she just doesn't give us any moisture. <laughs> Contrary to my size, I don't bounce when I hit the ground. I keep my feet right here on, but there are guys, we found some, there's a guy out of Dexter, Minnesota that we use very heavily. And Terry has a couple guys and those boys, they, they'd rather be in the air on the ground. They're fly boys. They like to be up there. And that's, that's the guys we utilize. In fact, the gentleman we had this year, Rob, was from Oregon. And we asked him, can you fly on annual ryegrass? And he said, well, I do it in Oregon. Don't you think I can do it in Minnesota? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, I'm asking you. Do you think you can do it? And he goes, well, yeah. Well, then as he's low in the plane, I notice his shirt pulls up and he's got his nine millimeter on his side. And I said, what's that for? I said, we get shot at once in a while. What do you do? He said, return fire. <laughs> he says, shoot at me, I shoot back. And he said, we get a coyote once in a while, we get a fox once in a while, and I'm thinking, just fly the cover crops on. Don't be shooting anything here. I got enough trouble with people when you're flying over their houses without letting off a couple rounds. So 
every train wreck we can dissect why it usually happened. Not, not that we're perfect, but we try to make sure we don't have those phone calls is what we're trying to get at. I like the planes, personally. Um, and after looking at this, I did not uh, attach the hyperlink to that YouTube video. Um, but uh, what that video is, I'll just kind of briefly explain it here. It's actually a YouTube video of Dave Robison, our cover crop uh, product manager that I've talked about before, um, driving through uh, southern Iowa. I believe he was around Otumwa, Iowa. This would have been um, February of 2012, if I remember correctly. But he was seeing a lot of the same stuff that you're seeing in these two pictures down here. Uh, down here. So um, he likes to call it black snow syndrome. Uh, you can go to YouTube and uh, search for Cover Crop Dave is his name on YouTube and watch his videos. He's got hours and hours of videos and a lot of different uh, situations. But as you can see here, these, these two pictures were actually taken just across the fence line from one another um, on Highway 30 just west of uh, Blooming Prairie. Yep. So uh, you can see here this uh, field was... Uh, fall tilled and you can see in the ditch a lot of black snow. So what does that black snow equate to? A lot of the same that that for one of that uh, the sign in one of my first slides equated to that's a lot of uh, soil and nutrients being moved off that field. That soil that your neighbor will probably be happy to get because you've spent a lot of money fertilizing it but you're not going to be very happy because it's leaving your field. On the other hand this is actually where we had a cover crop plot and uh, was not fall tilled. You can see a lot of the residue still out there in the field and a lot less black snow, really no black snow there. Um, so this kind of goes to the fact, to answer the question, do we need cover crops? This is a local area um, and two different management styles and you can see the differences there. Um, one thing I will say is that I will not take any questions about yellow snow. I don't touch that. So. The thing with these two fields that are unique is both of them were preventive plant fields in 2013. Both these farms had cover crops on. That picture on that side, the gentleman was told by his advisor, you don't plow that in the fall, you're gonna have a train wreck next spring. It's gonna be a disaster. The farm is light, it's sandy, it blows. They've closed Highway 30 once because of the, the sand blown over and he went and plowed it. We left the other side. The day he was plowing it, Dale went out, our cooperator on this side where we had the cover crop plots, and he plowed on each side of the cover crop plot so he could simulate fall tillage and leaving it alone. I went over and asked the guy, I said, why are you doing it? And he goes, well, they told me I had to. I said, who's they? Who's this they? Well, my advisor said, I better plow that or I'm gonna have a mess. I said, well, this summer we're out looking at the corn and he was there spraying, so he walked over and asked, if we could look at what we had going on, they saw some big ears and we took some temperatures and it was cooler on this side where we had a corn plow over the top than on theirs. And he said, I, I shouldn't have done that, should have I? And I said, well, they told you to do it. I said, go find they and talk to them about it. He just shook his head and went back and got in a sprayer and kept going. So, I mean, it was it was a learning experience, but they, they plowed some of it. Now, the thing was, is we did not know, and most of our producers did not know how it was gonna react. And I. I have a very good friend that's in the audience with me today, and we had many conversations about this is, how do we manage this? And, you know, there was some tillage, there was some non-tillage, there was, we did a lot of experimenting, but he's found out that he could make it work without as much tillage. So that's step forward to getting, you know, some more active soil and better soil biology going. So I believe that Bruce mentioned uh, just a while ago about uh, recreational spraying. I believe that this was a case of recreational tillage. So I don't know if there's a recreational tillage anonymous club that uh, they can go um, talk at or not. But um, here's another example uh, to answer the question, do we need cover crops? So this is actually um, from Dave Rob one of Dave Robison's ex um, uh, presentations that I took from him. This is uh, summer 2012. Uh, this is actually after a three inch rainfall on his home farm in Indiana. So uh, one little bit of background here is home farm has been uh, no-till for over 30 years. So what you would think would be very poor soil, very, um, very good soil um, as far as receiving nutrients and, and water. But after a three inch rain, you can see there's puddling in between the rows here. And this is Dave's foot uh, with his tingly boot and he just scratched the surface. Uh, about a quarter inch and there's dry soil right here and all around it is where um, the rain had rain had gotten in so the rain had only infiltrated about a quarter inch into that soil and that's in a long-term no-till system so do you think that these soils would benefit from from cover crop use 
So I'll get more into that here. Actually, the last part of my presentation is on uh, that farm. But um, so we've talked, babbled about the uh, advantages of the cover crops, uh, make you feel all warm and fuzzy to have more earthworms out there to have better water infiltration, all this and that. But but uh, I'm a middle child, and I've always got I've always had the one younger brother that's always trying to poke holes in all of my arguments. And I can this this slide I can see him standing in the corner with his arms crossed and saying, "So what?" So what if you have more more earthworms? So what? If, so what if we reduce uh, compaction some? And so what if we improve soil health and reduce erosion? What what does it all boil down to? So um, that's what I'll try to answer here. Uh, but as far as will cover crops work, especially in this area? Um, are the benefits real? Uh, have have we seen these benefits in this area in the management systems that uh, you all are using right now? Can we utilize cover crops in southern Minnesota? I believe that Jim answered that question pretty well in his opening speech or in his opening address there um, with Gabe Brown and how far north he is and how he's really utilizing cover crops and making it work into his system. So, and then the biggest question, um, in my opinion, is will cover crops return or provide a return on investment? It's all about putting money back in the farmer's pocket. And I said that at one, one meeting, and I had a gentleman in the front row raise his hand and say, well, is that so you can take it back out the next year? So being a seed guy, I always get a bad rap for that. But um, really what it all boils down to is the almighty dollar. It's what makes the world go around, whether you like it or not. Um, so will cover crops provide a return on investment? So um, this is a video that is on Dave's uh, YouTube channel as well. You can see in the search bar up there, cover crop Dave is his handle. Um, but I won't play this just for the sake of time, but uh, this is a video featuring TJ as well as uh, Brad Hagen, who's in the audience here. And since they're, they're both here to describe their experiences to you later, if you'd so like, I won't, won't waste uh, four minutes and one second um, playing it. But this tells the story of Brad and uh, how he utilized cover crops and how they really showed him a lot of benefit on his operation in uh, 2013 with Prevent and Plant. So the big question, in my opinion, um, can cover crops provide a return on investment? So can I spend 30 to $70 per acre on a crop that I will not harvest? Uh, can I afford to spend extra time managing a cover crop? Um, are there other ways I can get profit from a cover crop? And I believe that kind of dips into what uh, TJ will be covering after lunch here, so I won't touch on that. Um, but. So uh, kind of some backstory here. I've mentioned Dave's name a couple times. Dave Robson is our cover crop product manager. He's from Winona Lake, Indiana. Um, this information that I'm going to show you is actually from the summer of 2012. And what he was looking to do was compare crop health difference, uh, compaction difference, yield difference, and profit differences um, utilizing cover crops versus, versus no cover crops and also looking more specifically at certain species and mixes. So. Um, September 16, 2011, they simulated aerial application. Um, what they did, they walked out in their soybean field with a um, old style crank seeder and just seeded a bunch of different cover crop mixes. Um, some of the mixes and species that they did uh, looked at were annual ryegrass, crimson clover, radishes, peas, radish, oats, rye, turnip, crimson clover, and radish, oats, radish, uh, annual ryegrass, uh, winter cereal rye, and most importantly, they left a check, so they had something to compare to. So um, all of you remember 2012, how hot and dry that uh, summer was especially. Uh, wasn't any better in Indiana. In fact, it was probably worse. So here's a little synopsis of the growing season and the conditions that they, that they did this study in. So the rainfall from May, May 1st to July 31st was uh, 2.4 inches and um, over an inch and a quarter of that came um, after July 19th, so uh, very, very dry. Uh, 42, degree, 42 days over 90 degrees and eight days over 100 degrees, um, all-time record dry and heat uh, recorded for this area. So obviously very adverse conditions, probably not ideal conditions to be testing cover crops in, but um, it, definitely, it definitely did affect the results, and uh, you'll see that here in a little bit. But some of the observations that they made um, of these different plots. Um, so I guess I should back up one second here and just tell you exactly how the study was set up. They planted these different cover crop mixes um, the fall of 2011. 
2012, the growing season, they came back with the same hybrid of corn over across the entire plot. So these observations are of the corn crop in 2012 following the cover crop plot that was planted fall of 2011. So hopefully I made that more clear and didn't confuse anyone anymore. But some of the observations that they, that they made throughout this plot, so there were more corn roots um, where the cover crops were versus the check area, more moisture in the soil, which is very big, especially in a dry year like 2012 was. Um, and back to my good old friend, the earthworm. Um, there were more earthworms uh, where cover crops were versus the check area. Um, and of the species that they planted, the Austrian winter peas, crimson clover, and apen turnips overwinter, overwintered and were growing aggressively um, when sprayed before planting. So um, I don't want to dive into each specific species more, but uh, I'll be around to answer questions on, on that, and TJ will be covering that more tomorrow. So, And one thing I'd like to say is most those that overwintered in Indiana for them would not probably overwinter for us unless we had adequate snow cover and a little bit milder winter. We maybe could see some of those overwinter that is not going to be common practice in our area. So, um, and this is kind of the one that gets me, is not all plots with radishes were top yielding. Um, however, two of the three uh, had two of the three top yielding had legumes and radishes. So um, there's your poster child of the cover crop world, not necessarily delivering like always advertised. So that tells me that uh, it's more about the system and uh, the, uh, the management practices that you're implementing rather than just planting uh, cover crop radish. So, so here are the yield numbers from that, uh, from that plot. You can see uh, the check was 105, and that was about their farm average for that year. Um, if I remember correctly, it was their farm average for 2012 was around 102, 103, so right in that same ballpark. But you can see here almost 60 bushel difference um, with the Austrian winter peas versus the check. Almost 60 bushel difference, and you can see all the other um, the other yields. So the the least yielding cover crop plot was 15 bushel more than the check. So the least amount of benefit that he got in this project was 15 bushel from one year of utilizing cover crops. So I don't know about you guys, but if I was the seed rep that sold Dave this seed, I would be expecting a very nice Christmas gift. So uh, 2012, obviously, uh, crop prices uh, were much better then. I believe that uh, the uh, commodity prices that he used um, to generate these numbers was $6.50. Um, don't quote me on that. Someone could probably run math and figure it out, too. But um, here, we're seeing a lot of the same things that we saw on that first slide. The least amount that he gained um, by utilizing cover crops was 40, almost $42 better than his check. Then down here at the bottom is 286. That's the most benefit that he got out of the Austrian winter peas and radish. That's, um, that's shown as profit per acre. So that's a net advantage. So he made $286.94 more per acre by utilizing Austrian winter peas and radish than he did by not utilizing a cover crop at all. Again, that's one year of cover crops in a corn soybean rotation. So hopefully that answers the question of can cover crops provide a return on investment. But here's the disclaimer, and I've gotten pretty good at making disclaimers traveling with TJ. So um, why the better years, why the better yields? Why is it just traveling with me that you got to make this disclaimer? You got to travel with other people too, don't you? <laughs> Once in a while. Um, <laughs> why the better yields during a drought year? Obviously, the, um, the, the improved water filtration and water holding capacity of those soils that had cover crops on them was the biggest contributing factor to the yield differences. Um, not every year is going to return you or uh, give you returns and results like this. Um, I'll say that again, not every year is going to end up like this. Uh, I'd love it if it would, and it'd make my job a heck of a lot easier. But uh, Dave always says, don't expect a miracle in the first year, but look for one. So I always um, 
compare cover crops to any other management change that you're making, whether it's going from conventional till to no-till, um, you know, any big, big major management shift, it's a system. Um, it's not going to be a flash in the pan and really provide a lot of benefit in that first year, but in some cases it does. But it takes adopting to the system, really jumping in with jumping into it with both feet, adopting management management strategies that accommodate that system and make that system more profitable. When we did plots in southern Minnesota, coming out of the preventative plant here, we had cover crop plots. So we planted with a 20-foot drill. Last year we put corn over the top of them, one hybrid over the top. And I have those numbers that I can show you. We didn't put them up on the screen but I can go through those with anybody wants to talk about it. And I can show return on investment on those farms also, where we saw better return, better yield, better quality, but kind of confusing because some of the ones we thought were gonna be the better of the, of the mixes didn't turn out as well as we thought they were gonna, and the ones that we maybe didn't think were gonna work as well work better. So it shows the difference that the different mixes and on different farms. Both farms have different management styles. Both farms are in different shape. So it showed the, what it really showed was the one that was a very depleted farm where those pictures were where the snow was on that plot. We saw a couple of numbers there or, high, or uh, plots really do well versus on Brad's farm that had higher fertility and a better, better uh, soil structure to start with. We didn't see quite the return on investment on a couple of mixes that we thought we would. So it goes back to a management style. And TJ is getting ahead of me because I believe that's my next slide. But anyways, thanks for that uh, precursor. We'll call it. <laughs> I wanted to get ahead of you once. Um, so this is this page is, or this slide is just to show you that um, Dave knows what he's talking about. Um, first time I met Dave, for one of the first things he uh, said to me after I introduced myself, he asked me how old I was. I told him, and he said, "Boy, I've got blue jeans older than you." <laughs> And he probably does because I don't think he throws anything away. <laughs> but so he has a lot of experience um, with cover crops in the industry, in the seed industry, especially. Um, like TJ had said earlier, he's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know about cover crops, but a great resource for, for me to call on and for me to call on on behalf of producers that I'm working with. But some of Dave's accomplishments, if you will, he is on the Midwest Cover Crop Council, that very first website and the decision-making tool. He was integral in uh, developing that and getting that off the ground and launching it. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, some of the smaller cover crop uh, book handouts. They're actually put out by... Uh, Purdue University and uh, Purdue Extension, and I don't have one with me, but he was uh, one of the founding, or one of the members of that group that um, came up and generated that information. And um, he also was one of the founding members of the Practical Farmers of Iowa. So um, he does also have a blog that he writes on quite a bit. It's uh, plantcovercrops.com and it's uh, right here is the website here. But uh, he has a lot of very good uh, articles on there and different management situations and with where producers were looking to gain different things whether it's for um, livestock producers looking for more feed or um, guys looking to utilize cover crops and and row crop production so um, some local information and research that uh, TJ had already spilled the beans it's a lot harder to get the cat back in the bag than it is to let it out I was just uh, so excited Andrew <laughs> um, but uh, TJ and I especially have worked very hard to uh, get cover crop plots utilizing legacy seeds and the earth builder brand of cover crops um, and the mixes that we have uh, generated and compiled, especially in Southern Minnesota. We also have a lot of uh, cover crop plots throughout the state of Wisconsin. Obviously that's our home area in that. Um, but uh, I'm, the information that was generated after one year of studies was very uh, variable to say the least. Um, like TJ said, there were some expected surprises, some um, things that were some species that we had really built up and hoped to perform well that really didn't. So um, by having these local plots, especially, it gives us something more information to base our decisions off of and hopefully eliminate another one of those variables that I talked about earlier. So um, some other local information that you can uh, utilize is obviously the NRCS uh, soil water conservation agencies. Um, that's as far as like policies and things along those lines. Um, the uh, Freeborn County Soil Health Team, uh, TJ and I, as well as Jim, are uh, members of, uh, of the Freeborn County Soil Health Team. So um, that is a group of 
producers, agency people, industry rep, industry um, folks that have really come together with a common goal in mind to uh, to improve soil health within Freeborn County. So we all have our own little different niches um, associated with that. And they also have a website, I believe it's just Freeborn County Soil Health Team dot com dot org. Yep. I was gonna say I should ask the guy that that made it. So um, John's also been a very good, very big part of that as well. So, um, and then also local producers. Uh, this always surprises me, whether it's at trade shows or things like that, just talking to people. Um, I ran into an older gentleman here a couple weeks ago that had been utilizing cereal rye on his farm for um, close to 60 years. So he, uh, you know, it surprises me that even though this is really the new buzzword and the new um, excitement of the industry, it, it, it always amazes me how many producers have been doing this for a long time and have a lot of experience with it. So, um, so as far as how do you implement the cover crops um, on your operation, hopefully we've done a pretty good job of convincing you that you need to be um, need to catch this train, need to jump on the bandwagon, however you want to look at it, um, and to really utilize this and improve your operation. Um, first and foremost, I would say uh, do some test plots, some test strips, um, whether it's utilizing one mix, two mix, two different species, whatever it is, get some on your farm. There's nothing more valuable than, um, than research data and information that was taken off the ground that you're actually farming. So one thing I will say is to leave a control or check strip or a no treatment strip. I've encountered a lot of folks that uh, have said, well, I'm paying for this seed. I'm going to plant it from fence row to fence row. The heck with leaving a, a strip that I don't do anything on. But this is really, uh, really crucial to be able to compare against. Um, it's tough to compare apples to apples when you're comparing two different mixes and how they did and how it was last year because we all know that every growing season isn't, uh, isn't very similar. So um, experimenting with your management system, whether this is um, altering your um, cash crop maturities or things along those lines that we had mentioned throughout the presentation, that's a one, another way to, uh, to get in to, um, to implement cover crops in your operation. Um, the biggest thing I feel is to have realistic expectations. Don't be like Dwayne in my first slide with uh, five, six foot tall Sudan grass and walk into a field with rye, annual rye that's three inches tall and say, I got bigger cover crops than that. Um, you're not always gonna have that state fair winning radish. You're not always gonna have knee high rye, if you will. Um, there there could be some, some failures. I'll be flat out honest with you, with you on that. Um, but even though there may not be a lot of or substantial top growth, the improvement and the benefit that those roots and that um, extensive root system is having on the soil will make itself very apparent. Um, and that is one thing that we saw in a lot of our um, test, test strips and things like that as well. So, and then I threw uh, Dave's infamous quote back up there, don't expect a miracle in the first year, but look for one. So um, it might all, the miracle might not be that big top growth, it might be the yield of the soybeans following that. It might be the um, compaction layer that you knew was there that all of a sudden disappeared after utilizing radishes. So it's all about uh, how you look at, look at it. So with that, I don't have well much time. I guess I'd, I'll ask Jim if uh, we should take any, could take any questions, but I will be here the rest of the day. TJ will be here tomorrow as well. Um, and uh, I've got uh, a table set up with a lot of information in the back there, so. Yeah, it did. Yep, we had, we had tap roots down close to 29 inches. The, the question but, was, uh, he wanted to know after, after the um, radishes had broken through that compaction layer at three inches if they encountered another compaction layer deeper down, so. Yeah, and it did, it did. It hit another one about eight, nine inches down. And you could see it kinked again a little bit. And then the tap root went straight down. The best radish out there is about the size of your finger. That really is your best radish with a long tap root. You don't have to have that state fair winter radish. They're really neat. And everybody likes to hold them up and say, look what I got, it's great. But you don't really have to have that. That's, the, the smaller the tuber, the longer the tap root, the better off you are. If you have a really big tuber and a lot of them, you got some really awesome fertility that it's pulling up too. So that tells you that you got a really good active, biological active farm and you got good fertility and it's scavenging all that up, which is good. But 
it's also guys get the scare of, well, it's a big tuber, you know, the seeds are going to fall way down the ground. It's not, it's going to be there in the spring. We had a guy bought a crumbler for the back of his disc after 13 because he thought he was going to have trouble with those tubers. Well, you know what? They were all gone. It was, there was no problem. He sold the crumbler this fall and was very mad because he sold it for a lot less than what he bought it for. He didn't need it. But somebody didn't explain to him what was going to happen with those radishes. And he wouldn't be. Yeah, the next spring, he dissed the ground because he was just swore that big radish was going to be there in the spring and was going to be a total nightmare for him to deal with. And it wasn't. It was gone. It was just, it, it turns into like styrofoam. I tell everybody, it's kind of like crumbling up styrofoam. In the spring, it's gone. Okay, with that, Jim, would you want to? Okay. Well, thank you. Let's give him a hand, should we? Well, you know, I, I'm old enough, like a lot of you, to know that there's every trick to the, the you, you know, there's, you get into any new enterprise or concept, there's, a, there's always a learning curve. And cover crops are no different. And who you work with and their knowledge and background and experience and your seed supplier are very, very critical. And the problem is we tend to hastily just throw things out there, not really knowing or understanding what we're really trying to achieve. So what we're trying to do as a company is be a resource to you. We want to be an employee on your staff. And you can see that uh, if you get a little bit of uh, experience, it really helps avoiding a lot of the disasters that may occur or could occur. Back here, you might want to take a chance to go through this with TJ. This is actually five miles north of Albert Lee on the Fritz Jensen farm. And uh, the corn there, you can see that was aerial seeded in the corn the latter part of August. And you can see the 14 day and the 44 day and the same thing on soybeans uh, that was seeded right aerially right into the soybeans. So there's a number of different ways you can do it, but very, very effective. And the thing you got to understand when you start looking at a cover crop like that, there's probably four times the amount of root mass below as there is top growth above. And that's really what is key. Again, if you want to build your soil health, you've got to build a bioactive carbon. And there's no better way to do that than with root mass and healthy roots. And, and the more you do that, the more biomass you have, the more nutrient retention you're going to have, the more balance you're going to have, the more availability you're going to have, because nature wants to be in balance. And that formula has been put in place. And then the other thing is just the bioactive carbon. Who can tell me what percent of the weight of a plant is, is, is carbon-based, of the total weight above and below ground? It's 45%. Carbon is the backbone of all living things, plant and animal or human. And by getting your soils biologically active and producing that bioactive carbon, that can be taken up through the stomata underneath the leaf, but it can be taken up directly into the root. And you know, for years, I traveled with Ray Rawson and Francis Child. These were top producers around the country. And I was in a field that he had 500 bushel in. And everybody wanted to know what the magic bullet was. And looking back now, understanding more today than I did then, he had biology in that soil and he had mushrooms growing on top of the soil, and he had bio, bioactivity and bioactive carbon, and he was manufacturing CO2 in the soil from all the microbial activity that was being taken up by the root of the plant or in, underneath the plant, because carbon is the most important element of life, and I think it's the most limiting factor we have in crop production today, without a doubt, is carbon. And so, that's part of this whole equation. Now, the other thing you need to really begin to understand and just think, wake up every morning thinking about this, my soil is living. What do we do in production agriculture if you tour southern Minnesota, northern Iowa? We have living things on it for how long? How many months out of the year? How many months, Dennis? Six months. The other six months, there's nothing living there. 
So that means that we could feed you six months out of the year and you'd do just fine. It's something to think about. And so as, as we, yeah, Bill, you could probably go a little bit there, huh? Yeah. You could make it too, yeah. So that, that's something to kind of think about what it takes to have a healthy soil and that we need to really feed it on an ongoing basis. And transitioning is key. And I want to just touch real quickly on a, on a point that, that the, Andrew hit on. As you start building health in your soil, it's going to start holding material, nutrients better, more. And you're building biomass. And they need nutrition just like anything else. So we, I agree with Andrew. With the first three years, you want to be sure you're using these ores that are sitting on your table and you're keeping your, your nutrient base up. Then after two to three years, it'll naturally take over for itself. There's more nutrients in the soil than you could ever imagine, but they're just not available because of the way most of us have farmed in the past. By getting the biology there, they can unlock all of that and balance it. And so that's a really a key point that I thought he brought up. Uh, what I'd like to do now is have all of our sales staff come up, uh, if you would, just up front here, and I'll introduce them so everybody knows who they are. And while they're coming up, this is your opportunity to get with the uh, Bruce and the grain millers uh, as an example, or Andrew, or any of these people that are here today. And, and Farmer Dave, raise your hand, will you? We call him Farmer Dave. He's Dave Matthews. Dave is from St. Paul, Minnesota. He has a farm up in northern Minnesota, Pequok Lakes, I believe. And um, he is a superb grower of human food. And if you want to know how to produce high-quality brick and nutrient-dense food, you talk to Farmer Dave while you're here, and he'll enlighten you a little bit. Um, and we appreciate him being here. We got Bob Streit from Iowa. Bob is in the back there. Uh, just an excellent consultant and resource person that you can tap into. Uh, we have Dennis Clockengay over here. Dennis, how long have you been with the company? 13 years. 13 years. He's uh, just an excellent agronomist um, inside and out, and he works with growers all over the country. He probably has a customer base of close to probably 300 people that you interface with uh, year round. Um, one way or another, from Pennsylvania to the West Coast to Texas. Uh, but he's located up in Sauk Center, Minnesota. And he's my right-hand guy in the Dakotas with the colonies that we work with. Uh, these are big farming operations, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, they have a lot of uh, crop acres as well as livestock uh, involved. And we, you met TJ, and he, he's come on board. And all of our people work not only in the crop side, but they work with the animal and the manure side too, because that's a big part of our company. And then we got uh, the guy over here, our cheese head, Matt Doberstein. And uh, Matt is a human, uh, has a uh, dairy nutritionist background from University of, of Wisconsin. And he's doing great things over there in eastern Minnesota as well as Wisconsin. Uh, and we're working on some really neat projects right now and coming up with some new ideas. Uh, but he's doing a lot of work with the dairies over there as well as other people in, in that part of the country. And let's see, David Whitman, he's off-site. He's uh, got a, a growers in his site up there by Redwood Falls, uh, Seaforth area. And Dave, uh, uh, we just want to thank you for being uh, there. And David was, it's kind of an interesting story. David was a banker for one of our customers, Doug Rollick, who was a custom manure applicator. And then his family, they farm acres up in that area. And over the years, David saw what was happening to Doug's manure business. And it was just growing because of what, how Doug was treating the manure and was treating his customers. And agronomically, the responses they were getting. And besides all the, the site things that their customers liked, like no odor, not gassing pigs, that type of thing. And then what was happening on his crop acres. Because he was bio-augmenting the manure, the alkaline areas were going down, and et cetera. And so David made a decision here a little over a year ago uh, to come to work with us. So he's a consultant. And with David, we put together a complete financial program for farmers 
input as well as operational. There's no limit. Uh, and you work directly with David if you're interested in, in that aspect of what we do as a company. Um, I believe that directly covers, uh, did I forget anybody, Dennis? And then we have John here, Calcutt. And he's a cheese head too. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're so fortunate to have John because he's a webmaster, a video guy, and he just can do wonders with technology. So all this is being streamed live right now as well as recorded. We're running another site. So it's going to be a way of the future, a way people are going to be communicated to, and we're just going to keep escalating uh, that aspect of what we do as a, as a company. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, go ahead. At least when we go to the big game, we win it once in a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also obviously have a complete staff of people here. We have our own desktop publishing group right over here, produce everything you see, plus all of our labels and tech sheets that you have is all done internally. Um, uh, and we appreciate it. We have a staff in the back. We have two and a half acres under roof here in this facility. And uh, we store lots of seed. The basement will take 100 semi loads of seed. And we store a lot of seed for Alberley Seed House. Uh, we have three seed treaters in the back. One for just strictly organic, and we're certified every year for that, uh, GMO, and then the natural side of the, of the seed. We don't use any hard chemistry throughout our company except for when we treat uh, hard chemistry for Alberley Seed House. All our products, basically, uh, whether we work with conventional growers or organic growers, are pretty much the same. Uh, we do have some products that aren't organically approved, like Herbalite, Herbalite Plus, in some of our uh, fertility pr programs. Um, but we're, we're kind of an all-natural company. So with that, uh, what we're going to do is break for lunch, and lunch is going to be downstairs. So you'll go out that door down the steps and take a right and go down, uh, and uh, they'll serve you down there. And so what I would like to do is have, uh, Dennis, if you just give us a prayer, please. Please bow your heads. Lord, thank you for bringing us together today to learn and to share and to learn more about cover crops and, and all these different ways to make more profit per acre, uh, but to also follow it and do follow, follow God's will. Uh, may the food nourish our bodies, keep us safe, and take us home safely. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what I would recommend is if there's somebody here you want to talk to, Farmer Dave, about how to raise excellent uh, raspberries and strawberries and blueberries, or if you want to get with uh, Bruce, or you want to get with Andrew, or, or TJ, or any, it, you've got Larry in the back there too, Larry, the blue shirt. He's going to talk to us uh, at the end of the day about weather and markets. If you want to get next to him, grab him at lunch and sit down with him and, and visit. It's a good opportunity to do that. With that, uh, also, if you get back from lunch early, go around to the demonstrations over here. It's all about manure bioaugmentation, liquid or dry, and then we got cover crops up here. We got seed coating back there. Grain Millers has information. Larry has information sitting down there. Andrew has information. And uh, just pick it up or talk to him. Okay. We'll see you back here about 1 o'clock, about 45 minutes.